Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. We are hoping that there aren't any technical difficulties during this live stream because uh, I modified some things so that in theory, in theory, mind you, Sam will be able to hear the video clips I'm playing through the computer so that there's th through Skype so that there's no delay. Um, so in case you're new here, we play video clips, but Sam can't hear the video clips I play through Skype. So he has to hear them when they're playing live, but there's about a 30 second delay. So um, in theory, in theory, that may have been solved, but we're going to be kind of uh, trying it out live. So yeah. <laughs> there's always the potential that something goes horribly wrong every time I start uh, start uh, plugging new programs into the system and so on. All right. Now, we've been covering a topic in a lot of live streams, which is uh, along the lines of the Quran confirms the Bible and yet the Quran contradicts the Bible. And so the Quran self-destructs. Um, we've got a bunch of clips of Adnan Rashid that we're going to go through. You might wonder why are we spending so much time yeah. going through one main argument and responding to every Muslim objection that comes along? The very simple reason, if people actually learn this argument and how to respond, it's all over, ladies and gentlemen. It's yep, ball yep, game. Yep. It's Amen. done. Islam is done, right? Islam, yeah, is. Islam thrives on saying, oh, your book confirms my, I mean, your, your book confirms my prophet and constantly saying everyone else's scriptures are corrupted. If they lose that hypocrisy, if they lose the advantage of hypocrisy, in other words, being able to just change their methods as they go along and say whatever they want with no accountability, no intellectual accountability, if they lose that, they've got nothing because Islam is founded upon hypocrisy and double standards. So you take that away, bam, that's ball game. Sam, why don't you uh, run people through the basic argument yeah. and then we will probably jump right into some clips because we yes. want to get through these clips. Again, ladies and gentlemen, you're going through, you're, you, this is a master class right now, right? We're going through yeah. the, 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 the arguments that Adnan is using, as bad as they are, this is it. This is what they've got. Don't think, don't think we're, wow, his arguments are so dumb. Other Muslims must have great arguments. No, this is what they've got. And best. so if you actually learn how to respond to these things, this is the best Muslims have. And so if you're if you're pointing out some of these issues with your Muslim friends and you can respond to this stuff, you, you're going to have no problems. All right, Sam, run them through the Islamic yep, dilemma. Will. Yeah, now just let I want everyone know, sorry for any distractions or background noise. When Sam wants to distract and discourage us from focusing on Jesus, all hell breaks loose. So you're going to hear my neighbor who's <laughs> next door jamming his music he likes to jam it so loud you can hear it like four blocks away so i apologize for that and my brother's sleeping and he likes the air condition on so that goes on so guys please forgive me for that this is just saying trying to distract us but we invoke the father of our lord jesus that he washes us in the blood of the lamb shield us by the blood of the lord jesus fill us with the holy spirit remove satanic distractions and anoint david and i to speak truth for the glory of jesus and take muslims captive for the glory of jesus and strengthen you in jesus name by the power of the holy spirit we love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Now, <clears throat> as you've seen in these previous responses to Adnan Rashid, Adnan Rashid brings the typical passages that Muslims throughout the ages have used against Christians to try to deceive Christians and Muslims into thinking that the Quran claims that the Bible is corrupt. The two most prominent passages they use are chapter 2, verse 79, which we've already thoroughly decimated, and David has a short clip on that. You need to go watch this clip and memorize the points, absorb it until it becomes second nature and use it because that passage will come up repeatedly, chapter two, verse 79. But the second passage, which I was waiting for, I was actually waiting for this passage and I was surprised that Adnan Rashid took so long to bring it up. It's chapter five, verse 48. Chapter five, verse 48, I remember the first time I, I heard that passage being used against Christians was in the 90s. At that time, the internet was just catching on, and I had to go to the local Muslim bookstore in my neighborhood and get VHS tapes of the Muslims debating Christians. And one of the most prominent Muslim apologists at that time was Jamal Badawi. Ahmad Didat was very famous, but Jamal Badawi was actually much smarter, 
much better in his articulation of Islam than Ahmad Didad. And Jamal Badawi is known to be Shabir Ali's teacher. Shabir Ali is a student of Jamal Badawi. Jamal Badawi would bring up this passage against Christians in his debates, chapter 5, verse 48. So I'm going to encourage every one of you, do some homework. Go to YouTube. Thank God for YouTube. All these debates are now online for free. Type in Jamal Badawi, Anish Sharosh, or Jamal Badawi, Robert Mori, whoever it is, you'll see he brings up 548. Why? Because in 548, and you're going to hear Adnan articulated, and this is their best, folks. This is it. If you can decimate these two main passages, the game is over. Muslim apologists have no other passage that they can turn to to try to show that Muhammad denied the veracity of the scriptures. In 548 it says, and to you, Muhammad, chapter 5, verse 48, to you, Muhammad, we sent down the book in truth, confirming that which is between his hands and a guardian over it. Guardian over it. Wa muhaymanin alayhi. That word muhaymin, if you pick up any English translation of the Quran, you'll see it's translated variously. And Lord Jesus willing, by the grace of God, as the Spirit enables us to speak accurately to this issue, you're going to see that even the Muslim expositors of the past were all over the mat, all over the map, I should say, in regards to what does Muhaymanin exactly mean. Now, Adnan is going to say that Muhaymin means that the Quran guards the Bible in that the Quran determines which parts of the Bible have been corrupted, which parts of the Bible remain intact. But by the grace of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to show you that's not what the passage means. And game over for Adnan, game over for his prophet, game over for Islam, Christ reigns victorious. So that's what we're going to do. Amen. Uh... Nona Bubble says, uh, yes, but many Muslims would say that the Quran abrogated the previous messages, That's even okay. if you prove to them that the old books were preserved. So in other words, even if we prove that the Torah and the gospel yeah. are the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, um, yeah. Nona Bubble is saying, well, they can still say it's been corrupted. How would you refute that argument of new Quran revelations? Um, I'll go ahead and uh, offer a quick response, and then Sam, you yes. can add to it. But uh, uh, Nona Bubble, a abrogation, as far as Islam is concerned, is is abrogating commands on how to do stuff. So you can have, yes. you can have dietary restrictions in the Old Testament, and a later messenger can come and abrogate those commands. So that's how Muslims will point to the Old Testament and say, "You see, it forbids eating pork." You see, Muslims are right. You point out, well, it also forbids eating rabbit and camel, and Muhammad allowed that and did both of those. So what do you do? And then they have to yeah. say, well, those commands were abrogated. Yes, you, exactly. Yeah, you can't be abrogating theological claims, theological claims that don't make sense of Islam. In other words, when the gospel says that Jesus died on the cross for sins and that he's the divine son of God and that he rose from the dead, those aren't the sorts of things that can be abrogated. Those aren't commands saying, yeah. okay, for your time, you weren't allowed to do this and that, but now you can do this and that. Those aren't those kinds of things. Those are, I mean, yeah, a claim yeah. about Jesus dying on the cross for sins can't be the inspired word of God and then it gets abrogated later on. So those aren't the kinds yeah. of things that can be abrogated. That's it. Yeah. And by the way, that's interesting because if Nono is a brother, I don't know, brother or sister, he or she, I don't want to be offensive because I don't know. That anticipates one of my objections said none. In fact, I sent David Wood a link. What I did was I took some snippets from larger articles on answering Islam because I have two articles that go in depth on the word Mohammed. But because they're somewhat lengthy and many people don't like to read anymore. So by the grace of Jesus Christ, I took some snippets and I summed it up. And I just published it on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. One of the interpretations of the word Muhammad is exactly what David said, that the Quran doesn't say the Bible is corrupted, but the Quran determines which part of the previous legislation is still binding on Muslims who follow Muhammad, because that's actually the context. We're going to revisit the context. We're going to sound like broken records by the grace of Jesus Christ because we want this to sink in. In the context, you're going to see that the Jews are told to follow by their Sharia, meaning their law, the Torah. Then the Christians are told, follow by their Sharia, their legislation, the gospel. Then Muhammad is told, you follow the Sharia we gave you, the Quran. That's actually in the context of chapter 5, verse 48. And what is Muhammad told is that this Quran will determine for you and your community 
how much of the previous commandments are binding on you and how much of it you're freed from. But that's similar to what the Quran says about Jesus' role in respect to the Torah. What do I mean? And this was going to come up with my response to Don, so I'll be real brief. In chapter 3, verse 50, the Quran says pretty much the same thing when it comes to Jesus. Now, we don't believe Jesus of the Quran is a true Jesus, but be that as it may. It says that Jesus, quoting Jesus supposedly, that he confirms the Torah between his hands and make, making lawful, halal, some of the things that were haram, forbidden you. Now, again, chapter 3, verse 50. Notice what the Quran says Jesus' role was. Number one, he confirmed the Torah that he had access to, that he could read, right, <clears throat> that he could pick up. He confirmed that Torah as the uncorrupt revelation of God. But number two, he was given the authority to loose his followers from things that were forbidden to them in the previous legislation. It says that. To make lawful for you some of the things that were haram, forbidden for you previously. That's exactly the role that Muhammad envisions for himself. So if abrogation means corruption, that means the Quran is corrupted, Nona, according to the Muslim logic or your logic, because Muhammad abrogated his own commands. So if the Muslim says abrogation means the text is corrupt, then they just again buried Muhammad and destroyed the Quran because the Quran says that Muhammad would say one thing one day and abrogate it the next. That means the Quran is corrupt. It's no longer preserved. It's unreliable. Toss it in the waste bin. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, yeah, notice that we are going live earlier um, this weekend, and that's for European viewers who cannot normally catch us live because we tend to go live uh, at night. Although I have to say, uh, Sam on his channel often goes live uh, earlier during the day. So you yes. Europeans might want to subscribe to his channel. The link is in the description box. Also, um, we have some requests for the actual sources. Sam, Sam did send a link that's also in the description box to yes, the yeah to the sources that we're going to be um, going through here. As far as the Islamic dilemma material, Sam's got a bunch of articles on that. I've got a bunch of videos on that, and so you'll have no problem finding that stuff. All yeah. right, Sam, should we jump into some Go ahead. Sure. video clips? All right, so if, if you're just tuning in, we are. Going through some clips of Adnan Rashid as he attempts to defend his Quran. Once again, the problem for Muslims is that the Quran affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures and contradicts those scriptures. And hence, Islam is contra self-contradictory and it self-destructs. Muslims want to get away from that. And so they try to twist the Quran into saying things that it doesn't say. All the Quran ever does is affirm our scriptures, but Muslims try to make the Quran sound like it's condemning our scriptures when it just doesn't. Um, all right. Y'all, you ready? Go ahead, brother. In check, Jesus' check. name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in theory, in theory, Sam will be able to hear this clip. Does the Quran endorse the Bible? This is a very good question and the Quran answers this question in different verses. There are four set of verses. Now, what are these four points the Quran substantiates within its text? Point A, confirmation of the previous revelations given to previous prophets. Point B, the corruption of the previous scriptures. In other words, the scriptures of the Jews and Christians are corrupt. Point C, there are remnants of the previous scriptures in the literature around the world today. So we can still find the remnants of the previous scriptures, the original revelations, not the corruptions. The original revelations have survived in remnants in literature around the world. For example, there are remnants in the New Testament as well as some of the remnants can be found in the apocryphal literature which the Christians rejected in the first three centuries. D. Point D, the Quran is the guardian over previous scriptures. So the question is, if the previous scriptures are 100% preserved and we have exactly what was revealed upon Moses and no scholar will ever claim that, by the way. No scholar of Christianity or Judaism will ever claim that we have the original revelations of Moses or Jesus. So the Quran stands as a guardian. 
around the world. All right, I'm backing up uh, to this slide where Adnan uh, has his summary points up on the screen. The summary points are the Quran confirms the previous, the Quran confirms the previous original revelations given to previous prophets. I'm actually not going to dispute that. Uh, B, the Quran affirms the corruption of the previous scriptures, and he puts here Old Testament and New Testament. Now, if you're looking for clear verses on this, trust me, Adnan is never, ever going to give one because there are none. Uh, C, the Quran affirms that remnants exist of the previous original revelations. Unfortunately, Allah never, ever says that he's affirming rev remnants. He only says that he's affirming the books that we have in our possession. And the uh, and he's going to say that the Quran is the criterion and guardian. So those are, those are going to be Adnan's points. And uh, Sam, I actually... Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot to respond to in this first clip. It's just he's outlining his his argument. Anything you wanted to, to jump in there? Yeah, with? Now, David, I have to be honest and say this man is dishonest. He's a deceiver because he can't plead ignorance anymore. He's obviously trying to respond to you and me. He obviously has heard our thorough responses. No question. To, to the passages. There is not a single, and I want this, I want you Christians to remember this and chase Adnan and hunt him down and says, show us where it says, remnants of the previous scriptures we have quoted over and over and I'm, I'm getting frustrated to be honest may the lord jesus give me the grace to be patient because i know it's a spiritual blindness they're demonized like their prophet was and they need jesus to set them free it gets so frustrating when you repeat the same lie the same canard over and over again and they repeat the same lie over and over again because it's obvious he doesn't want to convince Christians who won't be duped by his rhetoric and his lies, but he's doling out meat to his fan base, those Muslims who could care less for the truth. Repeatedly, the Quran says the previous scriptures of the prophets have been preserved, incorruptible. We even quoted Muslim scholars that said the same thing in previous sessions. It's all documented in our articles. Jesus confirmed the Torah in, in his possession, which is identical to what we have today. Muhammad confirmed the scriptures of the Jews and Christians of his day as the uncorrupt revelations, which we have today in our possession. Not a word about corruption, only remnants. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And it gets tiring because, again, folks, why do I get tired? This is not about winning a debate. Let me put it in perspective. This is about our everlasting salvation. You are playing with the lives of people because, Adnan, if you're wrong and you're lying, that means you'll be responsible for leading people to hell by your lies, your deceit, and you're going to have to answer to Jesus Christ and their blood <clears throat> you'll be accountable for. You'll be guilty of their blood. It's not about winning arguments. Guys, don't forget, if there is a God and God exists, there is an afterlife, we better be right about what we believe about God or we suffer the consequences. But for him, it seems it's a, it's about winning an argument and deceiving Muslims. No, it's about a person's salvation. Fear God and stop lying and deceive them because their blood, you're, you will have to give an account for. Yeah. So may Jesus have mercy on all these people that he's deceiving and even on him to repent of his lies. So it gets tiring and upsetting because this is not a joke. It's not a boxing match. It's not UFC. We're not fighting for a title or for a trophy or for a check. It's about everlasting salvation, the souls and lives of people. That's at stake. So that's why I get frustrated. Tyler here says, why not have a formal debate with that nun? Uh, Tyler, I don't know if this is your first time here. Sam, haven't, yeah. haven't we been inviting Adnan to join us on this live stream? For either a discussion, he could we could just sit here and have a friendly discussion. Uh, in which case, yes. one of one of us, either you or me, would probably uh, be be more neutral, unless he wanted to, uh, unless he wanted to, you know, bring on someone else so that it's you know two and two. Yeah. Uh, or if he wants to have a formal debate, what topics have you already agreed yes. to Three. debate him on? Three topics. Here's my standing challenge: Adnan Rashid or Farida, Farid, even Ajaz Ahmed, even Shirali. Here's my three debate challenges. Does the Quran teach Tawheed? He's got to do that topic. Does the Bible teach a Trinity or the deity of Christ? It's his choice. I can do Trinity, deity of Christ. And does Muhammad teach the, the authority of the Bible or does he teach it's corrupt? I've already issued those three challenges. So go there, tell him Sam has challenged you, but he's already responded, David. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that. In one well, of the live streams, mm -hmm. 
one of the licensees, they think it was with Jazz, Had, uh, Ijaz Ahmed and Hamza Mayat, and he says, would you dialogue with someone who insults your mother? We respect Muhammad more than our mother. We won't dialogue with such people, because he was told, when are you guys going to debate Sam Shamoon? Okay. Right? And that was his excuse. So, but, you know, uh, so, yeah. so Tyler, if you're, that, that's, that's the uh, excuse there. Now, notice, notice, following Adnan's reasoning, we should never, ever have discussions or debates with Muslims following that reasoning. Why? The, the Quran calls us the worst of creatures, calls Jews and Christians the worst of creatures or the vilest of creatures. Surah 98, verse 6 of the Quran. So following his reasoning, we should say, up oh, Islam says that we're the worst of creatures, therefore we should never sit down. That I mean that calling us the worst of creatures, he's calling my mom the worst of creatures. This religion calls my my wife one of the worst of creatures. How could we have a dialogue with a religion that's calling us names like this? That's what we should say. But now we don't we don't say that. We say, okay, we understand your religion says this thing, and we understand you guys say horrible, blasphemous things uh, about uh, about the the triune God. We understand you do this, but we want to prove you wrong anyway. So why don't you sit down and, and we'll go ahead and prove you wrong? Um, but that's clearly, I mean, my goodness, that's clearly and indisputably a cop out because Adnan knows that he would get schooled. Think about this, Sam. Adnan is posting video after video after video responding to us. And then we say, okay, just do it in person. No, 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 no. I would never do that with, with, with these guys. Come on. Adnan knows he would get schooled. And he's trying, to, uh, he's trying to avoid it. One more comment from Islam Defender here. Uh, Islam Defender says, if you're the real Christian, so answer my these question by verse <laughs> by verse from the Gospels. One, the God is not human, so why the Son of God is human? Answer it only from verses. Islam Defender, all, all you have to do is understand what Christianity is claiming. Just go, if you want verses of the Bible, go to John 1, you read about the incarnation. That the Word, who was God, talking about the Son here, the Word entered creation, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? The word became flesh. So verse one of, you said only answer with, with Bible verses. All right, read John chapter one, gospel of John chapter one, verse one, and read all the way through verse 14. You have, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. If you read the context, this is talking about the divine son. Verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So you're asking why the son of God is human. The word became flesh. He entered into creation. If that's confusing for you, say, oh, that doesn't make any sense. This is nonsense. Well, then you've just you've just uh, destroyed your own religion. Because think about this. In Islam, Allah's eternal word is speech. It's not a, it's not a physical thing. It's not a physical book. But it enters our creation as a physical book. So we could ask you the same question. Well, if Allah is not a, a physical being, he actually is in Islam, but, but your average Muslims don't know that. Um, if Allah is not a physical being, how can his speech be a physical book, right? Well, it's a physical book. It's, it's a physical book because it enters our world and takes on a physical nature. According to your religion, the Quran has two natures. It's the eternal speech of, a, of Allah, but it takes on a physical nature in order to be in a physical book in our world. So if you have a problem with the eternal word of God in the Bible, who was God, entering creation, taking on a physical nature, and you say that's illogical and that doesn't work, congratulations, the Quran does not exist, or you have to say it's not the word of God because you've just destroyed your own theology of the Quran. Yep, exactly. Just wanted to really, because we have a Muslim here, he's mocking and attacking. He, my oh. my brother just walked by. No, it's gun shy. My brother walked by to get his food. And he goes, oh, is that Sam's boyfriend? See, David, he's confused. He thinks <laughs> hey, this is, you know, could, could, Shia. Could, Muslim, you, yeah. could, you ima could you imagine that Muslim saying that to your brother's face? <laughs> no. Yeah, because, guys, let me just share with you for the record. Of all the family members, I'm the one who is trying to be a Christian, even though I do so imperfectly and I fail. The Lord Jesus may have mercy on me. Though my family members are from a Christian background, they still got a lot of the street left in them. And my brother, you don't want to mess with him, just put it that way. <laughs> I don't want to go beyond that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen. Uh, uh, I've been around a lot of Sam's family family members. They all look like uh, they all look like pro wrestlers. They all look like you remember George the Animal Steel. That's what everyone. That's what that's what all, all these guys look like. Um, yeah, Sam, Sam, Sam. Sam's like Sam's like the 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 nice looking one. Sam's like the Sam's like the soft the soft 
gentle one in the family. Yeah. I don't know if that's a compliment, but hey, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. All right, we ready to we ready to go through some more. Yes. Uh, oh, also, side note, I don't know, I don't know if he's, uh, I don't know if he came back, but we had a Muslim yesterday who had, who said that if we could show him where the Quran. Uh, gets the doctrine of the Trinity wrong and misrepresents the doctrine of the Trinity, he would leave Islam. Um, I don't know if he fully left Islam, but he did acknowledge that the Quran has a problem there, and he said he'd like to know more about the gospel. We said we'd set aside... I don't know yet. I'm just I'm just uh, announcing this. Uh, but we said we, we'd set aside a little time in this live stream uh, yeah. to uh, address the gospel and any questions he might have. So uh, let me know if you're there and let me know if, uh, let me know if you see any comments by him to come back and we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, address that. All right. Yes. We're ready to go on. Go All on right, to yes. some more Adnan Rashid. Yep. Did he, does he bring up 548 or was that his point about 548? Cause we have to, unpack no, he's, he's going to, he's going to go through 548. You're, you're like, okay. you're, you're talking like many, many video clips down the road. A lot okay. of, a lot of this is going to be review of things that we already addressed in previous live streams. So we will go ahead and uh, we'll try to go through some of these pretty quickly. Okay. And so, so that we can get to, we'll basically try and play a clip, Sam, and then, uh, yeah. And then give some some quick commentary responses, and then go on to the next clip until we get to 5:48 because that that's a we want we definitely want to get to that. All right, here you go. So what are these verses? Very quickly, I will cover some of these verses. On point A, the Quran confirming the previous scriptures. We have chapter two, verse 136, where God mentions the original revelations of prophets like Abraham, Ishmael. Jacob and then the tribe of Israel revelations that came to them and then Moses and Jesus So in this verse, how do I know the Quran is talking about the original revelations once upon a time the original revelations? How do I know that because when we look at the names of the prophets? We do not have their revelations with us today. Where is the revelation of Abraham? Where is the revelation of Ishmael? Where is the revelation of Jacob? Where are the revelations of the tribes? Where is the original revelation of Moses? Where is the original revelation of Jesus? Jesus only preached one gospel. He did not preach four gospels. Did Jesus, Jesus was not preaching from the gospel of John, from the gospel of Mark, or from the gospel of Luke, or from the gospel of uh, um, Matthew. And we will go further. Jesus was not preaching from the gospel of Thomas. He was not preaching from the gospel of Mary Magdalene. He was not preaching from other gospels that were attributed to other authors within the first three centuries of Christianity. All right. Anything we want to comment on on that? I mean, we've been through a yeah. lot of this before, but he says that the Quran is affirming the original, the original uh, documents given to various people. I don't have any problem with that. The problem's going to come in when he wants to say they're corrupted. But what are your thoughts on on what Anand yeah, said? This is a classic case of circular reasoning. Guys, notice how he assumes what he's yet to prove. And I don't. Again, I I I want to give him the benefit of doubt. I honestly do, and say he's just ignorant and he's not qualified to be discussing these issues. But since he's passing himself off as someone qualified to speak about Islam and debate then I'm going to have to say he's being dishonest and he's employing taqiyah, even though I know he hates being accused of taqiyah and he accuses, of, uh, accuses us of misapplying <clears throat> what taqiyah entails. Because, folks, he says, where is the revelation of Ishmael? Where is the revelation of the tribes? Where is the revelation of Abraham? This, again, assumes what he's yet to prove, and he still doesn't want to get the point. He assumes that if the Quran says something, it must be true, but that's been our point from the beginning. Muhammad says, and guys, I want you to understand the objection. So maybe you can go and bombard his comment section, say, this is the point, Adnan, do you finally get it? Muhammad says to the Jews and Christians, your scriptures are the uncorrupt, preserved words of God. What God sent down previously to the Quran, he has preserved, and it's preserved in your midst. You have those scriptures, because God has made sure those scriptures remain intact, uncorrupt. Now, because Muhammad was ignorant of the context of the scriptures, and because Muhammad is hearing things being spoken orally, he starts aping certain things he hears, and he takes it for granted those things must be true. Little does he realize that the things that he assumes to be true actually expose that he's a fraud, 
He's not inspired and that his Quran is not the work of an omniscient being. So that when the Quran says that Abraham was given scripture, and yet we go to the Jews and Christians and the scriptures they have show Abraham was never given a scripture, that's an argument against Muhammad, not against the Bible. I don't know why he doesn't get this. If the Quran says something about the prophets before Muhammad, prophets mention the Bible, that does not correspond to what's found in the scriptures, that's proof of Muhammad's fraud. It's not proof that the Bible is corrupted. Yeah. Why? Because Muhammad said the Bible is the incorrupt revelations of God. So anything Muhammad says about the prophets of the Bible that contradicts the scriptures and the Jews of Christians, that means he's the liar, he's the ignoramus, he's the fraud, and the Quran is a lie, not the other way around. Now, David, maybe, again, I'm not sounding coherent. What does he not get? Uh, you know? Yeah, it's a, I, a, a four-year-old, a five-year-old could understand everything we're saying, right? You can sit a four or a five-year-old down and show this book confirms this book, which contradicts the the original, which contradicts the original book that said that it's confirming this book. It contradicts it on basic fundamental doctrines. You can hold up, you can hold up two books. It could be Dr. Seuss. If you said this book mm. confirms this book. But this book says this book is a lie. Do you see a problem? A kid's, a kid's going to see a problem. Um, Adnan, <laughs> is, Adnan just does it, right? Because, and, yeah. and, really, and really, that's the other thing. One, we want to run people through this entire argument and learn how to respond to the Muslim answers to the argument. But two, we want to, ex we want to show people what Islam does to the human mind, right? It makes it so that you can have blatant contradictions right in front of your face and you cannot see them. You, are, you become incapable of seeing them. Uh, you, can have, uh, you can have your entire methodology be built upon a foundation of hypocrisy and inconsistency and double standards, and you will not be able to see it. Even if we point out 50 examples of it right in front of your face, your mind will suddenly shut off once these things are being exposed about your religion. And so we, we want to draw attention to that. Uh, quick comment here, Sam. Yes. And we'll probably be watching clips, give a quick response until we get to the one we want to go to. Yes. But uh, I'll take some quick questions along the way if it's something we can answer very quickly. Uh, Mohaned Maya, uh, who I believe is a Christian because he left a comment uh, on the gospel yesterday. He said, I have a question, maybe a little off topic. I am a Christian and I was asked if all you need for salvation is to believe in Jesus and that he died for our sins. Does that mean I can go, uh, I can sin as I want? Uh, no, the Apostle Paul addresses this no. in Romans 6. Should we continue to sin so that grace may increase? By no means. How can we who have died to sin continue living in it? Uh, according to 1 John, if you actually, if you think like that, hey, now I can sin all I want. According to 1 John, you're not even a Christian. You have no real relationship with Jesus Christ. So this isn't simply, oh, Jesus died for my sins. Now I can sin all I want. You're entering into a relationship and covenant with Jesus. And if Amen. you are actually in that situation, and you think you can then sin all you want, you're not really in that relationship according to 1 John. But Sam, isn't it true? Yes. Isn't it true that according to Islam, they do have yes. things like that where you can sin all you want? Yes, in fact, I have on answeringislam.net, I want you to go, no, yeah, answeringislam.net, go to the search engine, put Sam Shamoon, salvation by faith, Islam. There are hadiths, and these are not weak narrations. This is like from Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, where Muhammad is reported to have said that anyone who says there is no God but Allah Muhammad is his messenger shall enter Jannah. And then the man asked him, even if he's committed <clears throat> sexual immorality, zinna, and theft, he goes, yes. And then he repeated again, even if he's committed sexual immorality and theft, he goes, yes. And he said it because he was shocked. In other words, it's Islam that teaches easy believism. Mm -hmm. If you say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, then, no matter what you do, eventually you'll enter hell. Now, it gets a little more complicated because the Islamic sources do teach that those Muslims who died believing this shahada, it's called the shahada, this confession from their heart, but haven't lived a pious life, they'll end up in Jannah, in paradise, according to Muhammad, but they'll have to spend some time in hell being purged by the fires of hell, almost like an Islamic purgatory, but not exactly identical to what the Catholics believe about purgatory. So I'm not trying to offend Catholics here. I'm not disrespecting you. I'm just simply saying that Muhammad had this concept that those among his followers who died confessing, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger, truly from their heart, there is no God but Allah. Even if they lived like immoral pigs, 
Yeah, they'll end up in hell for a while, but they'll come out because of that confession. Muhammad will intercede for them on the last day, and they'll enter Jannah. And these are in the authentic collection of narrations. And then added to that, Muhammad says, none of you will enter. This is in Bukhari. This is in Muslim. None of you will enter paradise by your deeds, your righteous deeds. And then they said, not even you, Allah. Not even me, had it not been for the mercy and grace of Allah. Sure sounds like it's Islam that teaches easy believism, not the gospel of Jesus Christ, David. What do you think? Yeah, and uh, Muhammad even pointed out, you can have sins as heavy as a mountain, and Allah will just take those sins and put them on the backs of Jews and Christians who will pay for your sins in hell, ladies and gentlemen. So, my goodness, you can have sins as heavy as a mountain. You can perform a mountain of sins, according to uh, Allah and Muhammad, and it's no problem because Jews and Christians will pay for your sins in hell, according to Islam. Now we do get we are getting a bunch of Amir, rational phobia, black angel, morgue one, two, three, theistic leaning agnostic, whining about the noise in the background. Guys, That's right. we, we said yeah. it before. Yeah. Too much noise in the background, people are saying. Okay, we'll no, take care of it. They're talking about when that AC or whatever kicks on. No, no, no. I'm not talking to you, Sam. I'm saying, guys, we said that in the beginning. We said there's gonna be we said there's gonna be the noise. Live with it. Or, or we don't like, what, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? The AC? Hey, the, hey Dave, the, what? <laughs> what? This guy just said, Harris al karima I'm a Trinitarian Muslim. What in the world does that mean? I think he's, I think he's, I think he's, he's doing some joking. I think he's, uh, oh, okay. he keeps saying it over and over yeah. and over again. Um, uh, <clears throat> all okay. right. So guys, all we right. we told you there's going to be background noise and stuff. Stop whining about it. The, the alternative is we don't go live. Is that what you want? So make up your mind, learn learn to deal with a couple of seconds of background noise. I understand that it it's a big, huge issue, but there are worse things to deal with in the world. All right. Oh, by then the way. Someone said, who was that big dude? That's my older brother. He's a bodybuilder. He's trained with Sergio Olivia. Don't mess with me, sucker. Yeah. You want uh, to go to the post? Hey, hey, Sam, actually, see, this is how this is how I come up with my awesome ideas that, that are like the best ideas ever in history. <laughs> Okay, that's it. They'll see you. It's a delay. I have to turn off the gift. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, what was I talking about? Um, this is where you come up with your brilliant oh, ideas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so someone said they like that Dr. Seuss idea, but uh, that's actually a perfect example. I'll go ahead and write a, a little Dr. Seuss-like children's book, and I'll have two of them. And one of them says that the other one is the Word of God, and the other one says that... The, the, the first one is a lie, right? So one will be affirming that the other one's the word of God. And the, the, that one will be saying that the other one is a lie. And it'll all be poetry and have pictures. And then we'll sit there and show it to little kids. And little kids will understand the problem. And then at the end of the book, it will say, and this is actually the situation with the Quran and the Bible. The Quran affirms the Bible, but the Bible contradicts the Quran and says it's a lie. And, uh, then it'll be cool because then kids will understand the Islamic dilemma before they've grown up and become Muslims and been indoctrinated to the point where they can't see the contradiction anymore. See, a four-year-old can understand the contradiction. A 40-year-old Muslim can't. He can't get it. He can't get his mind around it, right? His, his, his mind has been, has been distorted in such a way that he can no longer spot contradictions and hypocrisy in his own religion. All right, we ready to go on here? Yes, let's do it. All right, we are burning through. We are burning through some comments and right. some clips. So we're on Adnan Rashid, clip number seven. Here we go. Jesus only preached one gospel. The question is, where is that gospel? Christian missionaries continue to disingenuously use the word gospel, trying to insinuate that gospel actually means the four gospels. No. The word gospel in the Quran does not mean the four gospels. The word gospel in the Quran means one gospel, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is an article of faith for us to believe in it. We have six articles of faith, and one of them is to believe in the previous scriptures, the original scriptures, the original revelations that were revealed upon the previous prophets. So this is the first verse or the first point I wanted to cover from the Quran, whether the Quran confirms uh, the Bible or the veracity of the Bible or whether the Quran endorses the Bible. So it is clear now when the Quran talks about revelations in chapter 2 verse 136, it's talking about the original revelations of those prophets. Okay, Some of them have been lost. 
others have remained in remnants and we will see what comes uh, next. Hmm. Uh, all right. Now, um, oh. Sam, this yeah, is, get, this is, I don't know, this is getting funnier and funnier. <laughs> no, you see, you, you don't, you, the stuff like this doesn't bother you. I'll be honest. It kills me when yeah. I have to hear the same lie. Mm -hmm. You can take it in stride because you just laugh and destroy their profit. I get angry. So may God yeah. have mercy on me. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, guys, think about this. He's saying Christians are just being deceptive. They say that the Quran is, is talking about the, the four gospels uh, when it's only confirming the one gospel. Well, let me just run through this very quickly. The Quran says that we have the gospel. It's talking about a text, right? Surah 7, verse 157, which Anan, ironically enough, is going to quote. So he knows the verse, right? He knows yeah. the verse. He knows that Allah says we read about Muhammad in the gospel. Uh, Surah 5, verse 47 assumes that we have the gospel, right? That we're supposed to judge by what Allah has revealed therein. In what? In the gospel, right? In the gospel. That means we have the gospel. Muhammad in uh, Jamiat Termidi confirms that he says specifically Jews have the Torah, Christians have the gospel. He's talking about texts. He's talking about books we have. We've pointed out before, from the second century on, the four gospels were, when you were talking about a text, referred to the, the unit of the four of them, which were called the fourfold gospel or simply the gospel. If you're talking about a book that Christians have, that to a seven, to a Christian in the seventh century, if you said, hey, that book you've got is the gospel, they don't think, oh, you're talking about a book that I don't have, that I've never heard of, that's been lost yeah. and corrupted. Every Christian you're talking to would assume, oh, you mean this, that we call the gospel. We even had yeah. confirmation from Arab speaking Christians that they still call it that. They still call, right. they still call their book the gospel, right? So, yes. so notice Adnan needs this. He needs the Quran to not be affirming the book that we have when it clearly is. If it's talking about, oh, I'm just affirming remnants in your otherwise co uh, corrupt scriptures, we would expect him to at least say that once anywhere. And I've pointed this out before. Muslims, this would be like me coming up to you. You've got something that you call the Quran, right? You have a book that you call the Quran. This would be like me going up to Muslims who have a book that they call the Quran and say, and I tell you, I affirm your book that you have with you. It's the word of God. You have to judge by that book and you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon that book that you have. And then I walk away and leave. And then my followers come along 14 centuries later and say, oh, what David meant is not the Quran. No, your book's been totally toasted and corrupted. <laughs> he's talking about some other Quran that, that no longer existed. And he's just saying that there are some remnants of, of truth in your Quran. Wouldn't you think that I was the worst communicator in who ever existed if I walked up to you Absolutely. and said that? And that's what I meant. Well, same thing with Allah. If Allah means, oh, I'm just confirming that you have remnants of truth, little nuggets of truth in an otherwise corrupt book, he is the absolute absolute worst communicator. He has no business telling anyone about salvation or any other topic. He does not He does not have the ability to say what he means. And that's why he needs people like Adnan to come along 14 centuries later and say, oh, here's what Allah clearly means, even though it's something that Allah never says. What are your thoughts on this, Sam? Man, you did a perfect job of just basically decimating his point. We've said this over and over again. There's not really much to add, but you guys, please understand what David said. That's all I'm asking. Understand our points, memorize them, make it second nature to yourself, and then share it with the Muslims because Islam is a ship that's sinking faster than the Titanic by the grace of Jesus Christ. And he's doing everything he can to salvage <clears throat> the reputation of his prophet and his book. But he has lost. You know when Adnan lost? The day he chose to believe in Muhammad as opposed to Jesus Christ, who's risen, who's alive, who's conquered the grave, sin, and Satan. Mm -hmm. So you did an excellent job. But just again, remind them, Dave, learn these arguments. Yeah. We want more Christians to learn these arguments. It's it, it can't be just a handful of us. We want all of you warriors who love Jesus to be filled with the Spirit and start using these arguments because we have to destroy Islam for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit so Muslims get saved out of this lie from the pit of hell. Mm -hmm. That's all I want to say. Uh, Jeffrey Congolo says, uh, Anan keeps digging the hole. He should have stopped. Yeah. He should have stopped after David and Sam's first response. And that's true. Notice, Sam, uh, Anan's excuse for not debating you when, when, you know, it's Muslims who come along, it's Muslims who, who who keep sending us messages going, why are you scared to debate Adnan? We say, we accept, we, we, we agree to debate Adnan every single live stream. It's Adnan who, 
has already said, no, I, I, I can't, I can't debate them. They make fun of, they make fun of Muhammad. So he's the one making the excuses. But notice, he could have used that same excuse the from the beginning, right? He could have. When I posted that original video challenging Muslims, give us one verse, just one, just give us one verse that says that the gospel has been corrupted, just one. He could have said when when Muslims started going to him saying David is challenging all Muslims. Can you refute him? All he had to say was, "No, I don't respond to them. Those guys make fun of our our prophet." That's all he had to do. He had he could have backed yeah. down then. Why start the dialogue, start the discussion, keep getting schooled and then come up with the excuse that he that he doesn't want to interact with us when he clearly is. He's watching everything we put out and scrambling in a panic. Uh, but one thing I pointed out Sam right before we went live, I was like, "Since Adnan took that bait, hmm. Because he, he could have he could have said, yes, of course I can respond to that, but I won't respond to that because these guys are evil. He could have said that, right? And then Muslims would think, oh, so there is a response, we just we just don't know what it is. Um, he could have done that, but now that he's been interacting, now everyone is seeing it exposed that Muslims just cannot respond to this. Your book affirms our book and, con and contradicts our book. That means your religion self-destructs, right? Now people are seeing it. And so I told Sam before we went live, other Muslims who are watching Adnan just crumble. They can't let that happen. So very soon, you're going to see everyone jump in, right? You're going to see all the Muslim apologists jump in on this one in a mad scramble to confirm because they understand. They understand that their religion will crumble based on this. I, I know I know. if you're watching, you might th be thinking this is, a, this is a minor point. Oh, okay, the Quran affirms the Bible but contradicts the Bible. No, they understand that their entire apologetic approach is based upon, and you're going to see Adnan himself do it in these clips, their entire apologetic approach is based on picking and choosing what you want to believe about the Quran, picking and choosing what you want to believe about the Bible, picking and choosing what you want to believe here and there, and then anything, something doesn't line up with you, you you attack it and say it's been corrupted. That's their methodology, right? When yep. if we can if we can show, which we can, and we will continue to do, if we show that their God and their prophet affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our book, and that Anytime, anytime they say otherwise, anytime they say your scriptures have been corrupted, they're actually contradicting their own God and their own religion and they've apostatized. That's ball game, ladies and gentlemen. That was their own, that was what they had. That was the entire methodology that they've been using. If they lose that, they have nothing and it crumbles. All right. So that's why we're continuing to go up uh, to go sure. through this. Now, check this out. Pedro Jr., he's, he's, he's already, uh, he's already pointing out a problem that, that we're going to be addressing. Pedro Jr. He's a good says, brother too. Pedro Jr. says, bruh, this guy is an idiot. The four Gospels are Jesus' words. Jesus did not have a book with him that he quoted from. His words and actions make the Gospel. This is the best Islam has? Sad. Now, Pedro Jr. is, uh, is aware of this issue. You see, the Quran does say that Jesus came with the Gospel. The Gospel is revealed to Jesus. Jesus comes with the Gospel. So that's one thing. And Muslims want to cling to that. But the and so whenever whenever the Quran is talking about a book that Christians have, Muslims want to say, no, 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 it's just talking about Jesus' book. Well, it doesn't just say that Jesus has the gospel or Jesus brings the gospel or the gospel is revealed to Jesus. It also says, and Muhammad also says, both Allah and Muhammad say that Christians have the gospel in our possession. Now, we know the book that Christians had in their possession in the seventh century when these verses are being revealed. It's what we now call the four Gospels, right? It was called, then it's just called the, 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 the Injil, if you want to use that terminology. It's just called the Gospel. So, the Quran says that Jesus comes with the Gospel. Jesus brings the Gospel. The Quran also says that it's affirming the book that Christians have. So, Muslims want to try and say, no, it's, it's only affirming the book that Jesus brought. Well, that book Christians didn't have in the 7th century. They did have the four Gospels. So the Quran is affirming that book as the word of God. If Muslims want to say it's only talking about this, this other book that was brought to Jesus, well, that doesn't help them. That means Allah doesn't know what he's talking about. And we're, and we're back to the religion self-destructing. Allah is ignorant. Sam, I've thought about this a while. What, you know, How could you reconcile this if you were actually Muslim? The only thing I've been able to come up with, mm. and I'm saying this because this is... This is to anticipate Adnan. Adnan's about to about to make this make a big blunder here. The only thing I've been able to come up with to, to reconcile the Quran talk, saying it's talking about the gospel that Jesus brought and the Quran saying that it affirms the scriptures that the Jews and Christians have. The only way from an Islamic perspective I can see of reconciling those two claims is the exact same way Christians use the word gospel, right? 
Jesus brought the gospel. The gospel is revealed to Jesus. And that the, the, the gospel there is a message that Jesus is preaching. Yeah. But if you're talking about a text, you can also have the gospel as a book and that the Quran is affirming both of those. That's the only way I can make sense of this. If Muslims, if you say anything else, so just to be clear, Muslims, the word gospel can mean multiple things, right? Exactly. Can mean multiple yeah. things. It can be a spoken message. In fact, that, that's that's what it meant in the first century when the Romans would win a huge military battle or a new emperor would ascend to the throne, they would send out the the gospel. The gospel was a, a proclamation. So there it didn't refer to a book. It's just a message that's 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 being proclaimed. So that's, it can mean that. But the way Christians use it, they can also use it to refer to a book, right? So that's why Christians can say that Jesus preached the gospel and the apostles preached the gospel. And there you're not talking about a physical book. You're talking about the good news that's being proclaimed. But we, we also call the written, the written version of that, the yes. written book that talks about how that was announced, we also call that a gospel. So if... So those are the ways that that we use the term gospel. So we can talk about Jesus preaching the gospel, and then we're not talking about him preaching out of a book that he has in his hand. We're talking about the message yeah. that he's proclaiming. We talk about <clears throat> a physical book called the gospel, which contains the four gospels, which are the records of that message being proclaimed to the world. Yeah. That is the only way I can make sense of what Allah said, that he's talking about the gospel that Jesus has and the the four gospels as a unit called the gospel. If Allah means yeah. anything other than that, it makes no sense at all. And Sam, here's what's yeah. here's what's strange to me. Anan claims to be appealing to scholars and so on. And he'll 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 be showing, look, look, these scholars say the Bible's been corrupted. Oh look, these these scholars say say this and that. And then he'll completely go against all scholarship by saying that what the Quran is talking about is some book that uh, that Jesus brought when no scholar on the planet would say that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, just as Muslim apologists do with the Quran, they pick and choose what they want to believe and they throw out what they don't like. And just as they do with the Bible, they pick and choose and they take all the parts that they like and they throw out what they don't like. They have the same approach to scholarship. Let me go to this scholar. Let me go to Bart Ehrman. And up, he talks about textual variants in the Bible. I like that. We'll keep that. Up, he says yeah. that the, the death of Jesus is one of the best established facts of history. Nope, can't trust him on that. And that's how they go. And it's just the most inconsistent, double standards-based, hypocritical method that I have ever seen anywhere. And Muslims claim that this is the one true and tested methodology of the true religion. Yeah. This is absurd and insane. Yeah, but I want to just confirm what you said, David, from mm -hmm. Scripture, mm -hmm. your definition of the gospel. Folks, I'm now going to give you biblical backing, biblical confirmation, how he defined the gospel. Pay attention how he defined the gospel. He said something Jesus preached. You'll find that in Mark 1, 14 and 15. It can be the book that records and scripturates Jesus' message, life, death, and resurrection. Mark 1, 1. Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Not only that, <clears throat> you go to Romans 1 16 <clears throat> and 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Paul there speaks of proclaiming the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. And what is that gospel? You go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. Paul preached it, then wrote it down that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried. And on the third day, he was raised to life according to the scripture. So notice the New Testament itself defines the gospel as something Jesus preached, something that Jesus did, lived out, which includes his death and resurrection, something written, and something that the apostles preach. And when they preach, they're preaching not only the teachings of Christ, but the life of Christ, his death for our sins and resurrection. So the definition of the gospel, the manifold definition of the gospel, is found in the New Testament. Just to confirm what David said, Mark 1, 1, I just gave you a few. Mark 1, 1, Romans 1, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. So keep that in mind. So I wanted to do that. And that's, that's going it. to come up because Anand's just going to, uh, he's just going to dig himself deeper. And it's funny, we had a funny comment from the way here. He says, uh, he is digging a hole so deep, he will end up on the back of a whale. <laughs> 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 Me and Sam are laughing because we know what that we know what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> basically, ladies and gentlemen, you have the seven Earths in Islam, and and they're they're stacked up like pancakes, except with some space in between them, and they're on the back of a giant whale, and that whale uh, becomes agitated sometimes and uh, rocks around, and that's where you get uh, that's where you get earthquakes from. 
And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so and that's why Allah sent down mountains on the earth as tent pegs to hold the earth steady when it starts rocking from the whale shaking around in, in the form of, of earthquakes. And that's, keep in mind, Islam is the, uh, uh, is the uh, uh, fount of all science and learning in the world. All right, we ready to go on? Go ahead. Here we have more from the great Adnan Rashid. The second point is the Quran clearly confirms the corruption of the scriptures of the uh, of the of the Jews and Christians. Okay, and that can be seen in chapter two, verse seventy nine. So chapter two, verse seventy nine clearly states that woe be unto those who have written book who have, who have written the book with their own hands, and then they say this book is from God. Woe be unto what they write. Woe be unto what they earn. Because they are earning from it. So they did, they did it for worldly gains. For whatever reason why they did it, they did it for earning something. Right? So the Quran is very, very clear that the scripture of the Jews and Christians are corrupt. And even Christian missionaries have admitted that this verse may be talking about a group of Jews who had corrupted the scripture, the Jewish scripture. Of course, because there was only one group dedicated to this task, to writing the scripture. Not all the Jewish people were writing the scripture. There were special scribes writing the scriptures of the Jews, special scribes. So it was a small group of people who were writing the scripture. So the Quran is definitely talking about them, those who were adding into the words of God, and then they claimed that these words are from God. So this is the second point in the Quran that the Quran addresses when it comes to the question of endorsing the Bible. Now, now Sam, I, I can't regard this you, as, uh, as anything man. other yeah, yeah. than deception because he clearly watched my well, video the on the subject fell. because he refers to it, right? He says, even the Christian missionaries, he's talking about us there clearly because he says, have, have admitted that this could refer to a group of Jews corrupting their scripture. Now, that's basically what I address in my first two points. And then he ignores everything else and he ignores yes, what man. I what I actually said. So keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, Adnan Rashid admittedly watched this video that I put together, right? Because he's, yeah. he's responding to it and he's addressing us. Now, let me point out what I point out here, right? First of all, Surah 2, verse 79, keep in mind, this is the best. This is the best one they've got. I said it in my video. This is the best they've got. And this is where Adnan just went to try and show that the scriptures of the Jews have been corrupted. So I pointed out in my first verse, it doesn't refer, 279 doesn't refer to the gospel. And I said, so best case scenario, it could be talking about the Jews corrupting their scripture, right? And then he ignores everything else I said. He ignores everything else I said. So, so he he pays he jumps on that. Even the Christian missionaries, even the Christian yeah. missionaries admit it could refer to the Jews. No, if you just read the verse, it could sound like that until you read everything else and you realize it can't possibly be talking about that. So, yeah. quick review. Verse doesn't mention doesn't mean it doesn't mention the Torah or the gospel. But the context, there's nothing about Christians or the gospel in context. Exactly. Two, the Quran is talking about a certain group of Jews. It's talking about a party from among them, all right? That's the second problem. Third problem, the Quran elsewhere says that there are faithful Jews who would never, who would never do this. They would never sell their revelations for a small price. Then yeah. we have, according to Muslim commentators, this verse, it, it either refers to Jews of Arabia trying to cover up prophecies about Muhammad by writing something false and saying this is the word of God. They're trying to deceive illiterate people, right? Or it refers to Jews who were writing commentaries on the Torah and also claiming that that is the Torah. Neither one of those would corrupt the Torah. Um, since Muslims will reject this point, notice, Sam, if Muslims want to reject this point and say, nope, someone who writes something and claims that it's from the Torah, that means that the Torah would be corrupted. That's what Adnan just said. Anand just said it. It says that some people write write this and claim that it's the book when it's not from the book, right? We've done this. We've done this over and over again on here. Well, I will write something and I will say, this is from the Quran. It's not from the Quran. Could that possibly mean that the Quran has been corrupted to any Muslim? No Muslim will say that. And so what you, what you have here is, if I write something and I say, this is from the Torah, then Adnan will say, yep, that means all the Torah everywhere in the world has been corrupted. 
But if I do the same thing with the Quran, I say, hey, I just wrote something from the Quran. Uh, does this mean the Quran's been corrupted? He'll say, no. Suddenly his reasoning ability will kick in. So basically in my video, I go through verses that come before verse 79 of chapter 2, which say that Allah, Allah says that he's confirming the scriptures that the Jews have in their possession. Verse 85, just a few verses after verse 79, Allah condemns Jews for only believing parts of their scripture and not all of it, which makes no sense if, if Allah is really saying that he's only confirming parts of it. Uh, later in the same chapter, Allah once again says that he's confirming the scriptures that the Jews have in their possession. And all of this is ignoring what happens if we go outside of Surah 2, where Allah specifically says that Jews don't need Muhammad because they have the Torah. We have to ignore Muhammad pointing to a copy of the Torah and saying, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. None of this makes any sense given Adnan's interpretation. Now, yeah. Sam, if I, yeah. if I were to claim yeah. that a verse of the Bible means such and such, yeah. and my interpretation completely contradicted everything else the Bible said, and then a Muslim came along and said, hey, David's saying that this verse means this, but I, I will show you 26 different reasons it can't possibly mean what he says. Yeah. I would probably want to actually address those claims before I go on. I would probably yeah. want to show how I'm interpreting that correctly instead of just dogmatically asserting that this is what it asserts. But yeah. here we have, we can point out problem after problem after problem. We can show Adnan that he is contradicting his own God and his own prophet in his understanding. He's contradicting his own commentaries. None of this makes any sense in light of his religion, and he just doesn't care. And this yeah. is why we keep saying, this man is an apostate, so are his followers who listen to him, so are all Muslims who take this approach, which is all Muslims. These guys are not, they don't take the word of God, their God seriously, right? What what the Quran, the Quran condemns the Jews for saying, for just taking parts of it. The Quran condemns Muslims who would do the same, saying you're basically shredding the Quran when you do that. And then what do Muslims do? They take the parts they like, they throw out the parts they don't like, they're doing what their God condemns them for, they are not real Muslims, and they'd better hope that Allah the Merciful takes all of this sin and apostasy and blasphemy that they're putting out there and puts it on our back so that we can suffer for it in hell, because that's their only that's their only hope of escaping judgment here. What are yeah. your thoughts, Sam? Yeah, only one thing I wanted you to highlight, how wickedly, deceitfully, connivingly, he took your words and twisted it to mean, yeah, it was only a group of Jews that had charge of the scriptures, the scribes. Not all Jews were scribes, and it was the care of the scribes. Did you guys catch what he just did? Why am I getting frustrated and why I say that this man really is a deceiver and he's dishonest, and he doesn't have the guts to debate us, because I promise you, if this was a live debate, we had cross-examination, he would get utterly humiliated and decimated for trying to twist and pervert, pervert not just what his own false book and false prophet teach, but our own words. Notice how he twisted shamefully what David said. When David said a group of Jews, he was referring to a particular group of Jews at Muhammad's time, in Muhammad's vicinity. He was not speaking of the Jewish scribes. But you see what he just did? This is why I get disgusted. And may the Lord Jesus heal my heart to be patient because they're demonized like their prophet and they need to be saved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Sam, Sam, Sam get, I mean, if we, if we take... If we take the verse before this as connect as referring to the same group, it can't possibly refer to no, the No, because right? these people are ignorant. Yeah. Chapter 2, verse 78 says, Ummi. And by the way, folks, don't let the Muslims deceive you. The word Ummi does not mean someone who's illiterate in its contextual use. The way the word Ummi is used in chapter 2, verse 78, chapter 3, verse 20, chapter 3, verse 120, and chapter 62, verse 2. Even reputable scholars will tell you the word Ummi, and it's plural, Ummiyun, refer to folks who do not know the Bible. They are unlettered. There's a difference between unlettered and illiterate. Unlettered means they were not educated, they had not studied the scriptures. And this is why some translations, don't take my word for it, some translations will render the word ummi as Gentile, meaning those Gentiles who are not Christians and definitely were not ethnically Jews or convert to Judaism, who did not have the Bible and were ignorant of its contents. So. My problem here, David just did a masterful job of showing why Adnan is desperate and pathetically desperate. But here's where I got upset. David is talking about a group of Jews 
at Muhammad's time in Muhammad's vicinity, he said, yes, it is a group of Jews because not all Jews were scribes, so not all Jews copied the Torah. How do you stoop to this level of trickery and scheming and deceit and still maintain a straight face unless you are truly demonized like your prophet and you could care less about truth? Shame on you, Adnan, for doing this, not only to your false book and your false prophet, but to even the statements of your opponents. We try, we may fail, we try our best to be as accurate as possible representing our opponents by the grace of Jesus Christ. Because unlike Adnan, our God is the God of truth. He's not honored when we lie. So that's disgusting, and it's from the pit of hell. So I just wanted to focus on that. Notice how he twisted his words. Yeah, yeah David, a group. It means the scribes. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, there I was pointing out that the Quran says it was a group, right? So it's, it's not all Jews. It's a group of Jews. And he takes that, ah, uh, yes, the scribes. The scribes are the group that, that record the Torah. Dudes, for, first of all, I, I mean, I actually wanted to make a, a video out of this. Uh, have you guys ever seen Jews with a copy of the Torah? I, I have. I've been to a Jewish service where they bring the Torah out. Yeah. The, the reverence they show it. Yeah, the, yeah. the 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 yeah. I've never I've never seen that sort of reverence towards a book. The idea that and and how difficult it is to make. You, keep in mind, you're not talking about modern you know printing presses where you go in and you buy a copy of the Torah. Back then, you're talking about a massive handwritten scroll. It would take about a year and a half to make a copy of the Torah. And Muslims like Adnan think that Jews are just going in there and writing stuff into the Torah, completely changing the Torah. How would you do that? It would take you a year and a half to make a copy of the Torah that contains your alterations, <laughs> right? Oh, man. Right? The, the most straightforward interpretation, other than the idea that this is talking about, you know, the, the Talmud or something like that, commentaries, the, the only thing that makes sense is people wrote something down. If you're talking about writing something with their own hands, they wrote something down and then they went and passed it off and said, you see here, you see here, uh, this is actually what the Torah says about your prophet and you see how it, it's all wrong, right? There's no way they're going to sit down there and alter an entire copy of the Torah. Yeah. If, they, if they did, notice best case scenario for Muslims. If they did, if, Jews of, if the Jews of Medina rewrote a copy of the Torah, to lead people off the track of Muhammad. That wouldn't change the Torah anywhere else in the world, ladies and gentlemen. That's 100%. the problem. It could not. I could sit here with an actual Quran, and I actually did it. I actually did it for a video. I started writing stuff into the Quran. I started writing that Muhammad is the most obvious false prophet in history into the Quran. I wrote it into a copy of the Quran. Would any Muslim in the history of forever say that this means that the Quran has been universally corrupted? No, not one. They would not say that for one second. And yet that is what Adnan just said, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Some Jewish some Jewish scribes, even if we grant, even if we grant his ridiculous interpretation, some Jewish scribes altering a copy of the Torah would somehow magically corrupt all copies of the Torah everywhere in the world. And not only throughout the world, but those that existed before, that those that already existed in the past, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, exactly. and yeah. those that would come later. And it's just insane. And again, this is the best they have, yes, ladies right. and gentlemen. You're learning. You're, you're, people are watching this going, this is the stupidest nonsense I've ever seen in my life. Yes, this is what they have to say to defend their book. That's how powerful this yeah. argument is against them. Go ahead. I just want to add one point to just confirm what you just said. Let's take Adnan Rashid's interpretation for granted. The group means the scribes. But you mentioned it. Folks, remember these verses. David mentioned it. So let's go to this interpretation. Remember chapter 3, verses 113 to 114. Remember chapter 3, verses 113 and 114. And please remember chapter 3, verse 199, because it says they're not all alike, because there's a group among the people of the book who would not sell Allah's signs for a miserable gain, but believed in, in the signs and recited them correctly. So now let's go to his interpretation. Let's say the reason why it's speaking of a group means scribes. But the Quran says there was another group of scribes that would not allow the Torah to be corrupted. So you're back to square one, Adnan. Surprise, Adnan. And by the way, David, I just want to know something. Hmm. Why do people think I'm homeless? Like Jane Miller says, someone blocked homeless Shimon. He is what? Where do they get that I'm homeless? I don't get this. I mean, you know, of all the insults, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Jay you, Miller, you I don't know where you got I'm homeless. Yeah, because it, because you have a roommate, you're homeless. I don't know. That's oh, weird. Okay. All 
All right, okay. Just want to say. <laughs> so me. you guys got that point, right? If we go with a nun's interpretation, the group, because, yeah, it's only a group scribes. But the same Quran says they're not all alike, and there is a group that would not sell Allah signs but recite them as they were supposed to be recited, and they're upright. So that means now you have two groups of scribes. Yeah. In Muhammad's vicinity, a group that corrupted, another group that wouldn't corrupt it, and it says nothing about the Christians who are also copying the Torah. Adnan, mm -hmm. your days are over. Bye bye, Muhammad. Jesus is Lord. And so Adnan's view is that as of the writing of Surah 279, the Jews had already corrupted their Torah, and yet later, years later, Allah reveals Surah 5, saying that the Jews don't need Muhammad because they have the Torah. And Muhammad, later, then much years later than Surah 2, it tells the Jews of Medina to bring him a copy of the Torah, and he says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you, speaking to the Torah. How's that possible if the Torah had been universally corrupted then? Oh, he's just saying, I confirm certain remnants in you, right, Adnan? Because Allah's the worst communicator ever, and Muhammad is, is the worst communicator ever? This is, this is hilarious stuff. By the way, Sam, people were saying that homeless Shamoon, <laughs> not you, the person who named himself this. I want to point this out, guys, because I want you to see the Islamic mentality here. So look at this comment here. So first, the guy names himself Homeless Shemun. <laughs> and he says, didn't your God have sex with his mother, according to your Bible? No. Oh, boy, you buried Muhammad do, and do you tell. Do you do it? Do you do it to your mothers, too? Didn't describe, geni didn't describe genitals in Ezekiel, oh. kill babies, keep running. Sam. Can, can I destroy this argument and expose Muhammad? <laughs> You're making me excited, David. Yeah, so. because, guys, think about Sam. Th this is so hilarious, right? Didn't your God have sex with Mary? Notice, they're going with the Islamic understanding here that... You can only you can only produce a son by having sex. Now I know <laughs> I have an idea what you're going to point out with him that he just accused his own God of having sex with Mary because they also believe in the virgin birth. But what 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 do you think about this, Sam? Okay, folks, please, Christians, and by the way, Jane Miller, I'm sorry, I thought you were saying I was homeless. You were saying you were attacking this guy, homeless guys. You guys want to see how homeless Shamoon just buried Muhammad and Allah and exposed the Quran is a filthy book of porn and that his God is a wicked, immoral swine. You guys are ready? Mm -hmm. Christians, you ready? Yeah. Okay, and the Arabic-speaking Christians will confirm. It is actually his filthy Quran and mm -hmm, his wicked, mm -hmm. immoral prophet yep. that describes his God as penetrating. And I, I have a hard time saying this because it's about the blessed mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But since the Isa of the Quran is a satanic counterfeit, many of the Quran is not the real mother of our Lord. Chapter 66, verse 12. Arabic Christians confirmed to homeless Shimon, we just buried him with Muhammad. It says, and Mary, the daughter of Imran, Maryam binta Imran, who guarded her vulva, Ahsanat Farjaha, Ahsanat Farjaha, Farj, who guarded her vulva, we breathe into it, fi he, into her vulva. What a filthy, wicked, satanic, immoral way of describing the virginal conception and birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Here, the filthy Muhammad and his filthy God says, Mary protected her vulva, and, I, and I'm trying to be very G-rated here, and we breathe into the vulva to get her pregnant. Why, you dirty, filthy, immoral yep. swine. Why would yep. you describe the holy conception of the Holy Son of God in such a sick, perverted manner? And let me give another one because he mentioned... Ezekiel, guys, go to chapter 55, verse 56 of the Quran, and chapter 55, verse 74, chapter 55, verse 56, and chapter 55, verse 74, and chapter 78, verses 31 to 33, the filthy Muhammad turned Allah's Jannah into a glorified Playboy mansion because it says, good. Oh yeah, I just wanted to add because you're getting you're getting uh, you're getting confirmation from the Arab speakers here. Um, sorry to say this, but it means a female genital. So just to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you go to the Quran and how it talks about the virgin conception. Notice in 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 Christianity. <laughs> Christianity, God doesn't have to do any of this, right? God doesn't have to do, God doesn't have to sh show up and uh, blow into Mary's vagina or have an yeah, angel wow, do disgusting. it. Doesn't have to do any of that stuff. That's in, in Islam, you need something like that because, you know, you need uh, father and mother. So you need these these two things coming together. So there has to be the, the, the male presence there somehow. But um, uh, yeah, Sam, so... It says that that Allah blew into Mary's vagina. That that word there, farj, 
I actually wanted to see if I, this is back in the day. I wanted to see if it was still used as an Arabic word today. So I cut the Arabic. I just I just uh, cut the Arabic and I pasted it into Google Translate. And what actually popped up was the swear word that refers to vagina. Yeah, the that's, P word you yeah, mean, right? Yeah, that's that's yeah. how it's actually that's how it's actually used. So notice you've got this Muslim, you've got this Muslim saying, "Aha, you Christians, you're so sick and perverted." None of what they're saying has anything to do with the virgin birth, according to right. according to Christianity. According to the Quran, you've got your God, your God, the uh, vagina blower. So you've got Allah, sure. the vagina so blower. So we can use that word, by the way. We can uh, use we, it. I, I was hesitating to use it. Uh, we, yeah, we could call we could call Allah Allah the vagina blower. Okay. All I right. heard I heard I, I I heard someone say that Christian Prince has called him that before. He calls him Allah the vagina blower. Beautiful. All right. Beautiful. So we can call Princess we've got Beautiful. Allah the vagina blower, uh Aisha the semen scratcher. We can come up with nicknames for everyone. And you know, we we would tend to not use these uh phrases um out of out of you know an attempt to be nice but since muslims want us to come this way want us to come at this issue like this uh fine we'll come at you this way we'll come at your prophet this way we'll come at your god this way allah the vagina blower um aisha the semen scratcher uh yeah but let me give them the even more filth from the quran and they attack the bible and yet they live in glass houses guys remember the verses i mentioned chapter 55 verse 56 Chapter 55, verse 74, with chapter 78, verses 31, 33. There it says, awaiting Muslims in Allah's glorified Playboy Mansion, a, a, a Jannah that makes Playboy Mansion on earth look tame in comparison, you're going to have, it says, swelling-breasted whores, whores <laughs> whose, I'm not lying, man. I mean, yeah, see, you're laughing, you're going to think I'm lying. I'm not lying. <laughs> Swelling-breasted whores. <laughs> yeah, now Ooh, Sam, yeah, right? Sam, Sam, are you talking about... <laughs> Are yeah. you talking about the whore as in the hoary or as the whore with the, uh, the English word? Okay. The English okay. word whore. Okay. In fact, I was told, I haven't confirmed it, that the word uh, whore actually comes from this Persian word hur, which is the word in the Quran. That's what I've been told. I'm going to have to confirm it. I was told that our English word whore comes from the Persian word hur. That's what that's they are. They're in the Quran. They're called hur. But it says these, I'll call them huri. Huri are Women with wide eyes and their breasts are firm and they're swelling. But then it says, whom no man or jinn have deflowered, penetrated their hymen. I'm not making it up. In the Halali Khan version, chapter 55, verse 56. Here, let me get it up real quick because you asked for it, buddy. In 55, verse 56, here, the Halali Khan version. Let me show you how they translate it. These are Muslims. These are not Christians. Here you go. Let me get it for you, David. Here, here, Anali Khan. Okay. Wherein both will be those maidens restraining their glances upon their husbands, whom no man or jinn, yet mithuhunna, yet mithuhunna, in parentheses, has opened their hymens with sexual intercourse before them. Only a sick, filthy pervert, a sick, filthy, perverted mind could talk about hymens not being penetrated until the Muslims enter Jannah to penetrate them with eternal erections. A sick, filthy, demented, demonized pervert would talk this way. Yeah, and and guys, this all sounds extreme, but I mean, think about this. Think about the, the, the Islamic concept of paradise. You literally spend eternity deflowering virgins with an eternal erection that Allah is miraculously sustaining so that you can never have to take a break from deflowering virgins for all eternity. This is the most carnal and disgusting picture of heaven. No, no, no pagan in history, not the worst, most perverted pagans in history came up with this view of an afterlife. This is what the God of Islam came up with. This is what the Prophet Muhammad came up with. Absolutely disgusting. Now, Sam, there's a, um, we had a, darn it, where'd it go? Did I lose it? Oh, here we go. Uh, you have, <laughs> I like this comment. Uh, what's that? Yeah, no, go ahead. No. Someone said the Quran sounds like uh, this guy was hilarious. The Quran sounds like the original Easy Rider hustler. Go ahead. Yeah, there, there were. Uh, dang it, I lost the comment. Someone is pointing out that Allah must have blown the angel Gabriel into Mary's yes. vagina, right? 
Oh, there we go. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. 100%. So yeah, that was it. Because that's where the spirit so is supposed Allah, to be, right? So Allah blew Jibril into the wrong Mary's vagina. Flippin' filthy sicko. What a thing to assume. So uh, Allah blew the angel Gabriel, right? Because keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, you have the Quran and Allah talks about blowing into Mary's vagina, blowing the spirit into Mary's vagina. But then you have the angel Gabriel is the one who's showing up and, and doing it. Well, it says the spirit. Muslims interpret this as the angel Gabriel. So according to Muslims, the interpretation where the spirit is actually the angel Gabriel. Yes, Allah blew the angel Gabriel into Mary's vagina in order to exactly to start the virgin birth. Thank you. And uh, people living in glass houses, please don't throw stones. Yeah. Uh, so a uh, uh, Muslim mocker who came along and wanted to start mocking. Uh, did that did that go how you wanted? <laughs> Did that go how you Surprise, want it? David. Yeah. Now, Sam, Sam, by the way, the, on, the only reason I actually put that comment up there was because I, and we've pointed this out before, we actually sit down for a live stream and we say, we are going to post everything Adnan Rashid says to respond to this argument that we are bringing, right? If you're a Muslim and you actually believe that there is a response to the argument we're presenting, then you should be thinking, wow. It's great that these guys are gonna are gonna post everything Adnan Rashid says. That way, all the Christians here who didn't watch Adnan's video are actually gonna hear Adnan refute and destroy this argument. That's what you should be thinking, right? Instead, anytime we sit down and we say we're gonna go in depth on this issue, we're gonna examine all of the claims that Muslims make, we're gonna examine all of the responses they can offer, and we're gonna see if they actually have a good response, and then everyone has heard both sides. They've heard the Muslim points, they've heard the Christian responses. Everyone is in, an, in, is in a position to make an informed decision. And what do people, what do the Muslims do? They try to divert us from doing that in any way possible. Whatever you do, don't address that. Let me start harassing you. Let me start posting all sorts of nonsense comments over there. And how do you guys not get this, right? You, all, right. all I can conclude is you don't really believe you that. don't really believe that Adnan can respond to this. You don't believe there is a response to this, and you're terrified, absolutely terrified of people coming to learn what your religion actually teaches because it will ultimately destroy the religion. That's the only reason you would keep diverting the keep diverting our attention. That's right. And David, this brother, again, this Christian brother, Arabic Christian brother, has confirmed what we said in previous sessions. Muhannad, Muhannad Maya. By the way, David, we Arab Christians don't just refer to four Gospels as a Gospel. We also refer to the entire New Testament as the Gospel mm -hmm. and Geo. That's mm -hmm. what I've been saying. Yeah. Because all of it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's all his Gospel. So thank you, brother. And Lord bless you. And all our Arabic Christian brothers, sisters, all our Assyrian brothers and Christians, Egyptian, all Christians mm -hmm. who love the triune God, may the Lord Jesus bless you and use us to serve you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and we 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 pointed that out multiple times. But we try to we try to we try to give the benefit of the doubt as much as possible. So if you went to Christians in seventh century Arabia and you said, "I'm confirming the I'm confirming the gospel, the book that you have." We've pointed this out. At the very minimum, you are talking about the four Gospels, because from the second century onward, the four Gospels were referred to as a unit called the fourfold Gospel. But if Christians also referred simultaneously to the entire New Testament as just the Gospel, and Allah says he's confirming that, then it sounds like he's confirming all of it. And we've pointed out on previous live streams that you have a similar pattern with the Old Testament, where Muslims seem to think, about, think that the Torah is referring just to the the Pentateuch, the, the revelation to Moses. When you go to the early, uh, you go to the yes. Hadith, when Muslims are asked, where is Muhammad mentioned in the Torah? And they'll quote Isaiah, right? So it's clear that they're, that in among Muhammad's companions, they're thinking about the larger body of scripture, including the entire Old Testament as just the Torah. And so why not the same thing for Christians and the the New Testament? All right, we ready to, uh, we ready to continue? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Man, ladies and gentlemen, are you are you all ready to convert to Islam? Yep. Glory to God. We got a good crowd. We have about 1,600. Glory to Jesus. For nice. his glory. All right. The more the merrier. All right. Adnan's going to tell us more about the wisdom and revelations of Allah, the vagina blower, who can never say anything that he means and needs Adnan to come along 14 centuries later to correct his speech. Here we go. Clearly, the Quran, according to this verse, does not endorse the Bible. And how do we know that? We know that by 
the opinions of the companions of the Prophet on this particular verse. We have Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who categorically stated by quoting this verse that how can you go to Jews and Christians when you have the pure word of God in your hands, the Quran, while their books have been corrupted, while their books have been changed. This was said by Abdullah bin Abbas, the very cousin of the Prophet who took the Quran directly from the Prophet. This was his understanding of this particular verse. And you can see the Hadith on the screen. It's there. So this is what we were taught about the scriptures of the Jews and Christians, that they have been corrupt. And the Quran is categorical. Ad Nud loves this word categorical. I, I don't think it yeah. means, to go back to Princess Bride, I, I don't think it means what he thinks it means. Um, no. Now, Sam, yeah. uh, I, I've pointed out, I've pointed out, no, no, notice what he just did, everyone. He went to Ibn Abbas to say that our scriptures have been corrupted. Notice, he could not simply go to what the Quran said. If he simply went to what the Quran said, well, guess what? The Quran refutes him. He couldn't go to what, what Muhammad said, because Muhammad said that Jews still have the Torah. And he points to a copy of the Torah and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. So he had to go to a companion to say that it's been corrupted. But even here, Sam, I'm seeing yeah. the same problem over and over again, namely that Anand will look at all of these, all of these verses in the Quran, all of which are affirming the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Torah. He'll go to one that could, by a stretch of the imagination, be interpreted as saying that the Torah has been corrupt only if you ignore everything else. But he does ignore everything else, and he goes with his in, he, he goes with what makes him feel good and says that that verse is talking about the corruption of the Torah. So yeah. he does that with his God. He ignores everything his God says and then twists some statement into saying what he wants it to say. He does that with his prophet. His prophet affirms the Torah over and over again. Adnan ignores all that, throws that out. He goes to the Bible. He, he literally picks out, cherry picks verses that he thinks can support his religion, throws everything out. Everything else has been corrupted. He goes to scholars. He picks and chooses things that scholars say and completely ignores everything else because everything they say would completely destroy his religion. And now we see him even doing it with the words of Muhammad's companions. Here's, uh, here is... <laughs> Here's Ibn Abbas saying something, and Ibn Abbas is good as gold. So you know if Ibn Abbas says that the Bible's been corrupted, the Bible's been corrupted in spite of what Allah says, in spite of what Muhammad said, the Bible's been corrupted. It's clear from Ibn Abbas, Sam, is he once again doing the same thing, even picking and choosing the words? Yes. Even picking and choosing the words of Ibn Abbas to get the result yes. that he wants? Oh my goodness. 100%. You know what's killing me, David? Mm. If I believe it was the first session we did. Folks, this is why... I keep telling you, re-listen, re-re-listen until all this information becomes second nature, and then you make it your own and use it for the glory of Jesus. I believe it was in our first session when we we're dealing with the other Muslim, which I respond to you. A Muslim in the comment section, if I recall, brought it up. We already addressed this thoroughly. I even have an article on this because prior to YouTube, most of the debates that took place between Christians and Muslims were via written responses on our respective websites. So if a Muslim had a website, he'd respond to me, and then I'd respond to him on Answering Islam. Folks, go to answeringislam.net, answeringislam.net. When you go there, you're gonna to see to your left, it's gonna say the Quran. Click on that icon, the Quran, and then the section says what the Quran says about the Bible. You'll find we have two articles on Ibn Abbas, both of which I wrote, one of which is about this hadith. I have it pulled up right in front of me. I have this pulled up right in front of me. As I said in the first session, if you actually read what Ibn Abbas is saying, he's alluding to chapter 3, verse 78. Here, in fact, he read it, so I don't know if I should read it or not. But at, at, the, at most, what Ibn Abbas is saying is, don't go to the Jews and Christians. Why? Because they don't ask you about your Quran. That's actually the context. They don't ask you about your Quran, so why are you asking them about their scripture? even though the Quran exhorts Muslims to ask the Jews and Christians about their sacred history. So at most what you have Ibn Abbas saying is that you have here Jews and Christians who could care less about you Muslims, could care less about your, your Quran. Don't ask them about the context of their scripture because they will twist places, words from their right places by their tongues. So if you read it carefully, he still says nothing about the text being corrupted. If you read it carefully and honestly, 
What he's saying here is, how are you going to trust them to tell you what's in their scripture when they will twist words from the right places, right, <clears throat> and misinterpret that with their tongues, misleading you into thinking that what they're saying is from the book. That's all you get from this narration. And if we want to argue that Ibn Abbas is saying that the scriptures are corrupt, then we have a contradiction either from Ibn Abbas or for the for, or the reports attributed to Ibn Abbas because you have this tradition from Ibn Abbas suggesting that the Bible's corrupt, even though that's not what the text is saying, if you interpret it correctly. But then you have another tradition from Ibn Abbas cited by Bukhari. Bukhari, he cites it. And he says, this is from Ibn Abbas, where Ibn Abbas denies the possibility of the words of God being corrupted. Let me read it for you. Here it is. This is in <clears throat> Aisha Buley's English translation of the Sahih collection of Al-Bukhari, which is in my article on AnsweringIslam.net. And here it's chapter 60, oh, I'm sorry, chapter 55, chapter 55, the words of Allah Almighty, it is indeed a glorious Quran preserved on a tablet. By the mount and an inscribed book, Katada, who was a student of Ibn Abbas, uh, Ibn Abbas, said that Mastur means written. Yasturin means they inscribe. And the Umul Kitab is the whole of the Quran and its source. Now watch what Al-Bukhari is going to do, who he's going to cite, as the Lord Jesus enables us to honestly and accurately interpret even Muslim sources. Right? <clears throat> he said that, Ma tal fizzu means he does not say anything, but that is written against him. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas said, both good and evil are rec uh, recorded. And now his comment on the word changing, right, means they remove. No one removes the words of one of the books of Allah Almighty, but they twist them, interpreting them improperly. Folks, did you see what Al-Bukhari said? Now, some will say this is from Ibn Abbas. Others will say it's Al-Bukhari. Notice, let me repeat that part again. No one removes the words of one of the books of Allah Almighty, but they twist them, interpreting them improperly. Exactly what I said Ibn Abbas meant in that other hadith. Now, if this is from Ibn Abbas, either you're going to say Ibn Abbas contradicts himself, or this explains that hadith that Adnan Rashid misinterpreted to his shame and humiliation. But let's say this is not Ibn Abbas, but Bukhari's comments. That this is Bukhari saying this after citing what Ibn Abbas said about this particular phraseology. But that still would end up proving our point. Doesn't Al-Bukhari know about the hadith about Ibn Abbas that Adnan Rashid quoted? Of course, he recorded it. Al-Bukhari recorded that hadith that Adnan misinterpreted to mean that Ibn Abbas believed the Bible has been corrupted. But hold on, uh, Al-Bukhari. Why are you saying, you are saying that no words of God's books can be corrupted, meaning that the books of God are incorruptible, preserved. Didn't you know that the hadith you cited by Ibn Abbas says they are corrupted? So David, what do we have here? If Bukhari who records that statement of Ibn Abbas, still believe in the incorruptibility of the books, not the Quran, the books, meaning all of them. Doesn't that prove that even Al-Bukhari did not understand Ibn Abbas to be teaching that the Bible's corrupted? Now help me, maybe I'm not the most logical person, but help me see, am I missing something here, David? Uh, no, it's Adnan who's missing something and he's doing so deliberately, you have to, right? So n notice, ladies and gentlemen, um, Adnan can't actually quote the Quran to show that the Torah and the gospel have been corrupted. He can't do it, right? He has to stretch the interpretation on some things and to completely ignore everything else the Torah and the gospel say. He has to do the same thing with his prophet. He has to do the same thing with scholars. He has to do the same thing, the same approach with the Bible, picking and choosing. And now we've seen that he does the exact same thing, even with the commentators. Notice, Sam just gave you the full picture, right? Sam gave you the full picture. Yes, you have this in the Hadiths, and they could be interpreted in, in this way, but you also have these other passages, and they sound like they're saying this, and therefore the only thing you could, you could do is you could say he's contradicting himself, or you can reconcile them, in which case they don't mean what, what 
what uh, Adnan says they mean. What does Adnan do? He goes to the one he can use to support his view, throws out all of that additional discussion, which would completely refute his interpretation, and then he goes and passes that off to his followers, knowing that his followers would never in a million years actually do the research to see this. They trust this man. They trust their leaders. They've been trained and indoctrinated all their lives to mindlessly accept what their apologists say. And anyone who says otherwise is a liar who needs to be ignored, right? That's their methodology. And this is the man who's completely distorting everything his God and prophet and prophet's companions say. Everything the Bible says, Anan is twisting and distorting everything. And this is the guy that, that Muslims will mindlessly trust to give them the truth. What is this religion, ladies and gentlemen? What is this religion that it does this to people? Yep. All right, should we go on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, let's, let's keep it. moving. I like to move it, move it. Here we go. More so and on. Here we go. Yeah, baby. Point C, the third point in this regard is that the Quran also confirms that even though the scriptures of the, of the Jews and Christians have been corrupted, there are remnants within literature around the world. There are remnants of the original revelations that were given to the prophets around the world. And these remnants can be found in uh, the Old Testament. These remnants can be found in the New Testament. For example, the words of Jesus uh, may have survived. The original words, of course, didn't survive because Jesus spoke Aramaic and the Gospels were written later on in the Greek language. Jesus did not speak Greek. So, the meanings of the words of Jesus Christ have survived in some shape or form in uh, the literature that's extant, to, uh, that's extant today. For example, the New Testament and some apoc apocryphal Gospels, right? Got, uh, the, the canonical Gospels, the Gospels in the New Testament, do not tell us that Jesus spoke from the cradle, but an apocryphal Gospel tells us that, a Gospel that the Christians do not accept today. Then the story of Jesus making birds of clay and putting life through them, okay, by the will of God, that particular incident is not mentioned in the four Gospels. It can be found in an apocryphal Gospel. So we are saying, or the Quran is saying, the remnants can be found in literature around the world. So that was the third point the Quran makes in this regard. Um. <laughs> Like, this, I feel guy's bad a, for him. this guy's a gold mine of problems with Islam, right? right? Now, no, notice, yeah. notice, ladies and gentlemen, some of you know what he's saying right there. The, what the Quran is really saying is that there are remnants dispersed in various sources around the world. Um, now, notice, Sam. Yeah. You, you Arab speakers, does does the does the Arabic language lack the resources? for Allah to say, guys, what I'm actually confirming is that there are remnants of yeah. truth in various books that are spread around the world. Is there a way to say that in Arabic? Because Muslims tell us that Allah chose Arabic because it's this super eloquent language that can be used to clearly say exactly what you mean. And then Adnan comes along and he tells us Allah's trying to say this. And notice this is always the case, right? Uh, what does Allah mean when he says that you beat your wives into submission? Oh, he means tap them with a toothbrush. Well, w were there no words to say tap <laughs> yeah. them with a toothbrush, right? Yeah. Allah, wa Allah tries to say only fight in self-defense. But how does it come out? Fight those who do not believe. You, you, you quote that to Muslims. It says fight those who do not believe. What does it mean? Oh, it means fight people who are attacking you. Did Allah lack the words to say fight those who are attacking you? Did he not have those words at his disposal right then? And here we have... Allah is trying desperately to say, Christians, don't think for a second that I'm confirming the book that you have. I'm only saying that there are some true statements in it, just like there are true statements in all kinds of books spread throughout the world. He's trying desperately to say that, but he just can't get the words out right. And so he just keeps saying, yes, judge by your gospel. Yes, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon your gospel. Muhammad comes along. Yes, Jews have the Torah and Christians have the gospel. So Anan, once again, best case scenario, best case scenario, ladies and gentlemen, if we agree with everything Adnan says, the only conclusion we can draw is that his God is the worst 
communicator that has ever existed. He cannot say what he means. So even exactly. if we agree with every word Adnan has said, the only conclusion we should draw is whatever we listen to, we should never listen to Allah because we don't know what he means by anything he says. That's the conclusion to draw. Now, Sam, I don't know if you wanted to say something along those yeah. lines or about the other thing he said about the Injil, but what, what, what were you thinking? You know, yeah, because here, here's what's what's interesting. He mentions the story of Jesus fashioning clay birds mm -hmm. and breathing life into them as a remnant of truth, remnant of truth found in these disparate, you know, this disparate sources, so that the Quran is not confirming the gospel, but only these remnants that remain in there. Now, here's what's ironic. <laughs> We've said this like a broken record. The Quran is confirming the gospel that the Christians have. The gospel that the Christians have would be identical to what we have today. We've already established that. That would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, folks, here's the problem. Why do Christians not accept those stories? Because now it's going to backfire against them, David. Why do Christians not accept those stories of Jesus doing miracles when he was a child, as a teenager, such as fashioning sparrows from clay and clapping and them coming to light? That's actually what you find and the apocryphal sources, mm -hmm. even though it demonstrates that Jesus is God and creator and life giver. Obviously, we would want that story to be true, right? Which Christian would not want a story where Jesus fashions sparrows on the Sabbath day and he claps and they come to life because that demonstrates he's creator and life giver. So why didn't Christians accept it? Here's why we, di we didn't accept it. Not because it contradicts our theology. Not because it undermines Christology. It affirms Jesus is God in the flesh, the eternal son. It's because it's not historical. It didn't come from mm -hmm. eyewitnesses. It wasn't written by eyewitnesses or those who inter interviewed the eyewitnesses. So as much of a powerful testimony to Jesus' deity, this story happens to be, we need to be honest to our sources and realize, well, it's not historical. It's not written by an eyewitness. It doesn't come from those who knew the eyewitnesses. Therefore, it's spurious. And a second reason why we reject it, and I have to make this clear, because the gospel that the Christians had, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the fourfold gospel, in one of those gospels that no Christian disputes before Muhammad, during Muhammad, and after Muhammad to the present, if you're a Christian, we all accept the gospel of John. In the gospel of John, chapter 2, Read verses 1 to 11, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. There we're told that the first of Jesus' signs, the first of his miracles, was when he turned water into wine, and that coincides with the ministry of Christ beginning in union with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has already come upon Jesus in all his fullness. Now Jesus works in union with the Spirit to do miracles, inaugurating his ministry. Well, if, well, if John is an eyewitness... And John is a first century document. And even Bart Ehrman would say it's a first century document, though he doesn't believe John wrote it. Even he would say it's first century. And this first century document tells us the first of Jesus' miracles was when he was an adult, when he started his ministry. So he didn't do any miracles before that. How then can we accept any miracle stories attributed to Jesus when he was a child, when this would contradict a first century document that the church historically has always believed was written by an eyewitness to Jesus, the Apostle John. Thirdly, I'm trying to be real fast. I don't want to take too much time. But thirdly, it's ironic that this story is mentioned in the Quran. Folks, I want you to write down chapter 3, verse 49 of the Quran. Chapter 3, verse 49 of the Quran. Chapter 5, verse 110. Because there it says that Jesus created be careful of those translations that say fashion or made. You have Arabic speakers here, and I think Christian princes here. God bless you all for the glory of Christ. There it says, created, khalaqa, khalaqa, not fashion. He created from clay, teen, a bird, and he breathed into it, and it became a bird. It came to life, be it Allah, by the permission of Allah. Folks, chapter 3, verse 49, chapter 5, verse 110. Jesus creates exactly the way the Quran says Allah created Adam. In chapter 38, verses 71 to 72, Allah created, same verb, Adam from clay, and he says to the angels, when I breathe into my spirit, for the obvious purpose of making him alive, worship him, prostrate to him. So notice, 
Jesus creates life exactly like Allah. Like Allah, he takes clay. Like Allah, he creates a figure from clay. Like Allah, he then breathes life into that clay and it becomes a living being. In fact, this verb khalaqa is only used of Allah and Jesus in the entire Quran. It's not used for anyone else. So surprise at Nan, the very story that Muhammad ate ends up proving that in your Quran, Jesus is co-creator with Allah and life giver with Allah. So he's Allah's partner and one with him in creating and giving life. Mm -hmm. Surprise, David. All right, uh, a couple of quick comments here. And then I actually wanted to address another uh, thing that Anand said there. Um, we have uh, Michael Doty says, uh, Allah is the best worst communicator. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. The best. I'm gonna make a video. I'm gonna make a video called that. Uh, Allah is the best of worst communicators. <laughs> and all all I have to do is quote Muslims and what they say about their God, never meaning what he says. Um, Amir Hashwa said, "I am an Arab, and remnants means." And he gives uh, he gives some Arabic words for remnants. And he says, and you can't find in the Quran in the verses he mentioned. So he's saying that yes, there are perfectly good ways of saying remnants in Arabic and Allah just doesn't say remnants. I'm confirming the remnants of this uh, of this book you have. I'm confirming the remnants here, the remnants there. So there's perfectly good ways for Allah to say what he means, uh, but he just can't. And so that's why he needs Adnan to come along later. Uh, we have Andy Shannon saying, uh, hard to communicate when you don't exist. Yeah, so uh, you've got Allah. He, he he can't say what he means, and that's why he needs he needs people like Anan to come and communicate for him. When the Quran says over and over again that it's perfectly clear, and he just can't say what he means. This is this is, Sam. If if Anan's view is correct, we got to feel bad for Allah, man. Right? I mean, it's like I mean the way he's describing him, the way Muslims describe Allah. It is the closest thing you could think of is to a, a person who is like an, an, an Alzheimer's patient who's losing the ability to yeah. to say what he means, to remember things, can't remember things, can't say what he means, and is 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 slowly losing the losing touch with reality. Hey, Dave, That's what they're telling us about Allah. What's up? But you're telling me then Joe Biden must be another messenger of Allah. What are you doing here, uh, Joe Biden? Oh, who's a clearer communicator, Allah or Joe Biden? That would be See, an awesome another video. idea, See, man. This is how I come up with my my video ideas, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Joe Biden, messenger of Allah. Peace be upon Joe Biden. Here you have uh, Vinette Rich saying he is <laughs> talking about Adnan. She says he is categorically picking and choosing. <laughs> Adnan is categorically picking and choosing. Uh, Sam, I did want to address this other point here. Uh, and now people are saying, does does Adnan support Bo Joe Biden? Um, Sam, uh, Adnan also says we're not talking about the Gospels, which are written in Greek, because Jesus didn't speak Greek. Now, oh, two, now I have two problems. One, how in, the, how in the name of common sense does Adnan know that Jesus didn't speak Greek. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, oh, yeah. Greek was the English of the first century, right? Uh, Alexander the Great and those who came after him spread the Greek language everywhere he conquered, which included there, right? So everywhere you went, you could find people who spoke Greek. It's like English today. It would be like me saying today, oh, that person lives in Arabia. He can't speak English. Well, there are all kinds of people in Arabia who speak English, right? Because that it's it's sort of the English is like the common language yes. uh, that exists today. So one, how can Adnan know that two, basically three issues here based yes. on this one little thing. One, how in the name of common sense does Adnan know that Jesus didn't didn't speak Greek when tons of people in the first century 100%. would have spoken Greek? It was under it was under Roman control. And even the Romans would use Greek um, Two, if. If Jesus didn't speak Greek, why was his book revealed in Greek? Everyone keep in mind, the word Injil, the word Injil is a transliteration that goes through Syriac, right. apparently. It goes through Syriac that ultimately yeah. derives from the Greek word euangelion. Now, yep. euangelion, euangelion, ladies and gentlemen, is it's the Greek. word gospel. It's the one, it's the word that's used in the gospels. Uh, when Jesus spoke the gospel, it's euangelion, right? Trans keep in mind, transliteration is where you take a word and you put it into another language that doesn't have the same letters, and so you try and get it close. Well, you put euangelion into Syriac, and then from Syriac into 
Arabic and you get Injil, right? Euangelion, Injil. Euangelion, when you go through Syriac into, uh, into Arabic, becomes Injil. Notice, the title of Jesus' book, according to the God of Islam and according to the Prophet of Islam, the title of what Jesus brought was the Injil, Gio, yeah. the Injil, which is the Arabic version of the Greek word euangelion, euangelion. So why was G why did Jesus' book have a Greek title if if Jesus didn't speak Greek and the Quran is saying don't go with the books that are in Greek? Why does it have a Greek title and not yeah. some other title? Yeah. So that's two and three. If we can't Sam, if we can't trust what the Gospels say because they have Jesus speaking in Greek. And oh, Adnan, problem, and, and Adnan doesn't want doesn't want uh, doesn't want Jesus speaking in Greek, even though he in all likelihood would have spoken Greek. How yes. can we trust what the Quran says when it has right. Jesus speak in Arabic? And Jesus, as a first century Jew, most certainly would not have spoken Arabic. Yeah, but not just Arabic, David. It's a seventh century Qureshi dialect because according to Sal Bukhari, guys, Sal Bukhari. <coughs> You go to volume six, number 510. Sal Bukhari, volume six, number 510. When Uthman asked Zayed and his companions to make fresh copies of the Quran that was compiled during the reign of Abu Bakr, that was in <clears throat> the possession of Abu Bakr and then Omar. And when Omar died, it was in the possession of Hafsa, the daughter of Omar. He said, if you disagree on anything, guys, this is volume six, number 510, write it in the dialect of the Qureshi, the Quraysh dialect, Muhammad's dialect, because it was revealed in that dialect. So you have not just Jesus, Jesus' followers, not just Jesus' followers, Jesus' mother, Zechariah, John the Baptist, a Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, all the prophets who didn't know Qureshi Arabic, speaking Qureshi Arabic in the Quran. So... If Adnan says that the gospel is disqualified from being the gospel of Jesus because it's in Greek, because Jesus didn't speak Greek, he just destroyed the Quran, which means all those portions and sections of the Quran where prophets who didn't speak Kreshi Arabic are speaking Kreshi Arabic, he must now excise from the Quran, shred it, do what the Quran says, shred those parts, throw them in the waste bin, because it's not possible to have prophets speaking a dialect that they did not know of, the dialect of Muhammad in the 7th century. But you know what Anand's going to tell me? You kafir, you stupid, don't you know Allah? And when he sends down the, the wahi, he can accurately translate their words in Muhammad's mother tongue. Oh, Allah can do that for Arabic, but God can't do that for Greek. So God cannot inspire... Jesus' disciples and their companions to accurately record what Jesus said in his mother tongue, if he didn't speak Greek, which he would have, in Greek. So God can't do it for Greek. He can only do it for Arabic. What an amazing God this is that only Arabic. He can only do it in Arabic. Oh, Allahu Akbar. Mm -hmm. You got it, David. Yeah, and uh, guys, there's, a, there's, there's one more issue here. Um, I've been wanting to make a video out of this for years. I may have actually mentioned it in certain videos. I don't remember, but I've, I've wanted to make a point out of this. The Greek word in geel yeah. is, is, is. was used. It, it had a kind of Jewish context among Greek-speaking Jews, and it had its context uh, in among the Romans. And it, it doesn't it's not it doesn't just mean any kind of good news. You wouldn't say, oh, I found a quarter. Well, that's the Injil, right? Good news. I found a quarter, right? It's used of a certain kind of good news. And in its Roman context, I've already mentioned earlier, in its Roman context, the word in the well, it would have been euangelion, but if we're talking to Muslims, the word Injil among the Romans would have referred to, again, either News of a tremendous military victory. So if the Roman legions went out and conquered the, the barbarian hordes and then came back, they would it would be announced before they're coming back that they had triumphed and this that this was going to bring peace to the nation because they'd conquered the barbarians. That proclamation, that good news was the gospel, right? That's how they used it. That, so that's one. Uh, the other context, the other context among the Romans was when a new emperor rose to power. And since he was going to bring peace, 
then they would call that the the announcement that a new emperor has taken the throne. That was the gospel, the good news. Right. So that's its that's its Roman context. The Jewish context in even in the Greek the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's used in passages which talk about God returning to his people. The announcement, the good news that God is returning to his people and once again taking his throne over the nation of Israel. Now think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Here's the point. Good news do doesn't just mean random good news, like like we would say good news. It referred to, it was a technical term. It referred to certain kinds of good news. If you were talking about the Romans, it referred to a new king taking over and a tremendous victory being won over the enemies. If you're talking about its Jewish context, it refers to God returning to his people and taking the throne over his people. All right. Why is this relevant? Well, even the Quran says that that's the message that Jesus brought. Well, guess what? The Christian understanding of the gospel, of what Jesus was here and what happened, that makes perfect sense of the term that they're using, right? Was there a new king on the throne? Absolutely. His name's right. Jesus. Was a tremendous victory won over his enemies? Yep. Right at the cross. Had God returned to his people who were in rebellion? Yep. Was he now enthroned, right? Roman context, Jewish context, the word the, the word gospel makes perfect sense for, for Jesus referring to this as the gospel and for his followers referring to what happened as the gospel. It's the new proclamation that a king has now been enthroned who has achieved victory over his enemies. It makes perfect sense. If you go with the Islamic view, none of that makes any sense. That would exactly. not have that would not have been the good news. It would not they would not have used the term for Jesus coming along, performing a bunch of miracles, and then God takes him to heaven, tricks everyone into believing a false revelation, and then the message is corrupted by the Apostle Paul. Oh. The, none of that makes any none of that is in jail. None of that is gospel. None of that there's not one element of the gospel there. So that term would have never in a million years been applied to anything that Islam yeah. it, that Islam says about what Jesus did. So, ladies and gentlemen, the point here is you're talking about Jesus would have brought this uh, his revelation in Aramaic or in Hebrew or something like that. The Quran and Muhammad call it the Injil. Injil yeah. is a Greek word. So that means the revelation's in Greek. Why is the revelation in Greek if Jesus didn't speak Greek according to you? And it's not referring to our books, which happen to be in Greek. And apart from that, the word that's being used doesn't mean any random kind of good news. It refers to a specific kind of good news. The Christian message includes that specific kind of good news. The Islamic message doesn't. This is further evidence that the God and prophet of Islam have absolutely no clue yes. what they're Amen. talking about. How are you Muslims still defending this? Now, David, let me add two more examples of the Arabic Quran taking over terms that came from Greek. And this is important. Christians, remember this argument about Injil? And you Arabic-speaking Christians, can you please confirm this in the text? Even the name for Satan, Iblis, that is a loan word from the Greek, Diabolos, Diabolos, Iblis. Muhammad, again, in his ignorance, thought Iblis is the name of Satan, Shaitan, when it's simply <clears throat> the transliteration of the Greek word Diabolos. But then it gets even worse, even funnier. Anyone who is an Arabic-speaking Christian, especially Lebanese, know that the name of Elijah, in Hebrew, Eliyahu, was translated in the Greek New Te Testament as Elias. And that's why you have a lot of even Lebanese Christians called Elias. Elias. Elias is not the Arabic cognate of Eliyahu. Elias is the transliteration from Greek. From Greek. And folks, guess what the Quran calls Elijah? The Quran calls Elijah Elias. And at one time, it even pluralizes his name to Eliasin. Elias, Eliasin. Uh, excuse me, Allah. Uh, 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 excuse me, please don't get angry when I. Elias, Eliasin. There is no such thing as a pl pluralizing proper names. But why did you call him Elias when that's not the Arabic cognate of Eliyahu? That's from Greek, Allah. I'm just saying, I'm wondering because your servants say 
The gospel can't be the gospel if it's in Greek when Jesus spoke Aramaic. Just saying. But anyway, go ahead. Mm -hmm. All right. Should we continue? Yeah, man, this guy is fun to destroy Islam and Lady, expose Muhammad and glorify Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, um, and, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, now that Sam can actually hear apparently the clips that I'm playing, we, we'll be happy uh, We'll be happy to take clips from all kinds of people. So we, we want to be really thorough in addressing everything Muslims say about this particular argument, because, uh, again, if, if people get this down, it's all over. It's all over. And... Yeah. and this is this is most useful. This is most useful to Christians, right? Because keep in mind, any doctrine you can defend from the Bible that contradicts Islam, if you're presenting the gospel to a Muslim and you show them from the Bible that the Bible teaches this, the only thing they can say is your Bible's been corrupted. If you then use that claim to refute Islam and show, wow, your God affirms my book. So if you're saying it, you're saying it's wrong, then you've actually refuted your own religion. Um, so this is massively helpful to Christians. But Amen. even if you're not a Christian, you can use you can be an atheist and use the exact same argument. You can say, look, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the Bible or the Quran, but the Quran affirms the Bible and the Bible contradicts the Quran. And therefore, your religion <laughs> self-destructs. So atheists can use this. So this is massively helpful to everyone. Sam, I see you cracking up laughing. What are you, you laughing at? What, what, because what's going uh, on? And, and, and Andy Shannon, I'm listening to you. So, you know, I can do both. He says Adnan is a special kind of stupid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, uh, David. Yeah. Elijah means God with us. Surprise! Yeah. These are the uh, these are the language experts of uh, of Islam. Um, so anyway, guys, we want to be very thorough in responding to this. That's why we're spending a lot of time with Adnan. But once we kind of get through this, we uh, since we have uh, since we have the technology now to just really go through video clips, we'll probably be pulling up all kinds of video clips from um, from Zakir Naik and from Muslim, other Muslim apologists and just wreaking havoc on them. We'll probably get to a point where we just say, guys, uh, pick out video clips that you want us to respond to and send those to us, and then we'll uh, we'll go ahead and watch them live. Just and point before out the you problems. Go to that clip, before we go, got a clip, we want to give credit where credit due is due. We mentioned this brother before he's on again. Nak Dimon is a Jewish follower of Jesus. He's a top-notch apologist. I hope he gets back in the saddle, does more work. God bless him. And Alan Ruhl. Mm -hmm. He's a Catholic apologist with an excellent blog and a YouTube channel. And he's a precious brother who loves us and loves the Lord. God bless you. Just wanted to say that. Go ahead. And Nabil Yunus said, Sam is making me proud of my Christian faith. Hallelujah. That's what I'm here for. And guys, pray for us. David will tell you he wants to finish the race, use of Jesus, destroy Islam, get Muslims saved, and strengthen the church. And I want to be used of Jesus to strengthen the church, die glorifying him. Pray we finish the race, because that's why we're here. There is no other reason for us to be here except to glorify Jesus. He's worthy. So pray for us and our families. All right. Surprise, Sam. It's more Surprise. It's more Adnan Rashid refuting his own religion and making his own God look like a complete doofus and loser. All right, here we go. Point D. The fourth point is that the Quran is the guardian over the previous scriptures. Why do you need a guardian if the previous scriptures are fully 100% immaculately preserved? They are not preserved. That's why the Quran is the guardian. The Arabic word is muhaymin. Muhaymin means a guardian, a corrector, right? A supervisor. Okay, so the Quran supervises the previous scriptures in confirming what was actually revealed upon Moses and what was actually revealed upon Jesus. So this point is very, very important. Now, having given you these set of verses, Four points the Quran makes very clearly. To repeat, to summarize very quickly, point number one is that the Quran affirms belief in the original revelations upon prophets. Number two, the Quran clearly confirms the corruption of the scripture of the Jews and Christians, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. The Old Testament in chapter 2, verse 79 of the Quran, there's a verse there that clearly indicates that, that clearly uh, states that the scriptures have been corrupted and for the New Testament we have chapter we have chapter 4 verse 157 where the doctrine of the crucifixion is denied categorically right that means the four gospels are corrupt they have this information on the crucifixion which is not true which is not correct so the Quran is categorical about that belief in 
and gentlemen, I just want to have this up on the screen real quick just to just to run through these four points. So A, the Quran confirms the previous original revelations given to the previous prophets. Have no real problem with that. Uh, B, the Quran affirms the corruption of the previous scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament. And keep in mind, what verses did he give? Surah 2, verse 79, which, as I've already shown, and he has not answered, can't possibly be referring to the corruption of the Old Testament. It can't possibly be saying that because it would contradict everything else Allah said on the subject and everything Muhammad said on the subject. Can't possibly mean that. He continues to pass it off as uh, as a categorical verse. And the New Testament, keep in mind, what did he say from the New Testament that shows, uh, what did he show from the Quran that shows that the New Testament has been corrupted? He says, Surah 4, verse 157, which just denies the crucifixion of Jesus. Well, we agree that the Quran contradicts the gospel. What we're questioning, what we're questioning is where it says that the gospel has been corrupted. It doesn't, and you can only get that by com once again completely ignoring everything Allah and Muhammad say. See, the Quran affirms that remnants exist of the previous original revelations. It's odd that the Quran affirms this without ever once saying that it's confirming simple remnants of the scriptures. It just says it's affirming the books. And D. The Quran is the criterion and guardian over all previous scriptures. Now notice, if you just read the, the Quran is the criterion and garden, guardian over all previous scriptures, you would think that that here again is confirming that the Quran is affirming the previous scriptures, but no, it's somehow, it's somehow affirming that our scriptures have all been corrupted and that Muslims have to go and pick and choose what they want to believe out of our scriptures. Now, Sam, I know that, yeah. that you really, <laughs> you really wanted to get to this teaching about yeah. the Quran being the guardian, uh, yep. but here he kind of only mentioned it, whereas he's about yeah. to go, he's about to go in more depth and actually okay. go Let's through the passage. Want to just move on? Oh, yeah, yeah, I want to hear his argument because, guys, please listen, because after we decimate, annihilate his interpretation of 548, it's over for Adnan, over for Muhammad, over for the Quran, that Jesus Christ is glorified. So listen. And, and, and guys, guys, think about this, right? We, we, we point out to our Muslim friends, hey, your, your God and your prophet repeatedly say nothing but positive things and affirm our scriptures. And you've got a problem because our scriptures actually contradict your revelation so you got a problem here right so that's what we that's the objection we bring to them their response no the quran affirms the the corruption of your texts in surah 2 verse 79 of the quran which if you actually read can't possibly be referring to the corruption of our text it can't it's not even a possibility if you read the entire chapter let alone the entire quran so that's one response their other response is ah but our book completely contradicts your book so therefore the quran cannot be affirming our book Wrong. Your Quran can affirm our book and still contradict it. That's what we're saying your book does. You don't prove exactly. us wrong. You don't prove us wrong by admitting that we're right about your book contradicting our book. Now, the, so, so those are their first two responses. Here's their other response. Their other response that they can give is Surah 5, verse 48 of the Quran. It says that the Quran is a guardian. And so what this is actually going to mean is that the Quran is telling you to go to the Torah and the gospel, pick out all the parts that agree with Islam and throw out all the rest. That's what Allah is doing. Keep in mind, you got to be patient with Allah because he's the worst communicator in all of history. He can't say what he means, but that's why Allah sent his final prophet and messenger, Adnan Rashid, to say what he actually means. All right, so we're going to go ahead and go through uh, these clips and actually get to his argument because that's what we wanted to get to. If this fails, what else do they have, ladies and gentlemen? What else do Nothing. they have? All right. Nothing. And here we go. Another indication of the corruption of the New Testament is in chapter 5, verse 47, which the Christian missionaries very conveniently use to argue that the gospel of Jesus Christ is in the four gospels. Okay, They claim that the four gospels are the gospel of Jesus Christ, even though they are in conflict on many matters. The four Gospels contradict each other on many, many issues. Even that, is, even though that's the case, the Christian missionaries argue that the Gospel of Jesus basically is the four Gospels, okay, which doesn't make sense to any sane person. But they use chapter 5, verse 47, in order to substantiate the four Gospels. And what is that verse? 
Let us read it. Chapter 5 of the Quran, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by what God has revealed, then they are the wrongdoers. Okay? humul fasiqun. They are the sinners. So they use this particular verse, the Christian missionaries, to argue that, look here, the Christians are being told to judge by the Gospels. All right, so uh, the, he, notice, uh, this is chapter 5, verse 47. He's using this as a lead-in. And, and notice, yep. we're, we're, ladies and gentlemen, we're being deceptive by saying that when Allah tells Christians to judge by the gospel, and he affirms that we still have the gospel, and Muhammad affirms that we still have the gospel, and we say, this is referring to the four gospels, he says we're being deceptive and misleading when that was the name of the book that included the four gospels. Again, again, Muslims, if I walked up to you and I said the Quran, and I was talking about some completely different Quran, and I don't bother to tell you what in the world I'm talking about, and you assume that I'm talking about the Quran, you say, yes, he affirmed the Quran. And then my followers come along 14 centuries later and say, you see, they're lying. They say that Allah refers the Quran. They say that he's affirming the Quran when actually he's talking about a different Quran that they don't have. That would make no sense. That would make no sense. So when Allah tells Christians in the 7th century, judge by the gospel, and the gospel either refers to the spoken message, or it refers to the collection of the four gospels, or it refers to the entire New Testament, if he's talking about a book, it's either the four gospels or it's the entire New Testament. Which is it? I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt and will say it at least refers to the four gospels, and Anand says you're just being deceptive and misleading. Yep. Any okay. thoughts, or should we should we go on? We've done a lot. No, they got the point. You guys got this desperate spin. So let's see how he's going to spin 540. Because guys, I promise you, if you listen and don't forget, the material that I produce for this talk is in the description box. So as you're hearing his interpretation of 548, click on the link to this post that I produce for 548. Watch how Adnan embarrasses himself and destroys Muhammad and the Quran. All glory to Jesus Christ. So let's do it. And Sam, uh, Nak uh, Nakdamon said, uh, how do the words therein mean only in part rather than everything that is in it? And ladies and gentlemen, this is the problem. Notice it says, let the people of the gospel, right? It refers to the gospel. So it's calling us people of the gospel. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. In what? Therein what? In it, yeah. Yeah, the it's the only thing it referred to, the gospel. That means that we have the gospel. If he's saying, you guys, you have to judge by what Allah revealed in the gospel, that assumes that we have the gospel. And according to Adnan, what Allah is really saying there is, let the people who claim to be of the gospel judge by the remnants of the gospel that they find in the corrupt the corrupt New Testament, which nevertheless contains remnants of the gospel. He says we have the gospel, and he says we're judging by what Allah revealed therein, in it. That means that we have it, not that we have remnants of it. Do you, do, do you guys see how he can't? He just can't stop contradicting what his God sure. says? Therein, sure. gospel. That means we have the gospel. What does Adnan say? Oh, what, what he really means is uh, judge by the remnants of the gospel. But he just can't say remnants, even though they're perfectly good Arabic words to mean remnants. This is That's amazing. a surprise, David. Surprise, surprise. Man, dude, you don't get the surprise. Man, good. All right, here we go. Now we're cooking. Now we're cooking. Add on. <laughs> All right, and here we go. But no, if you look carefully, the Quran makes two very important points in this verse. And what are those important points? The Quran says, let the people of the gospel not gospels, not plural, one gospel. Which gospel? The gospel that was revealed upon Jesus. Because the verse before, chapter 5, verse 46, clarifies who the gospel was given to. If you go to verse 46, it clearly states that the gospel, one gospel, one message was given to Jesus Christ. So therefore, the people of the gospel... You must judge by what God has revealed therein. So now, what is God telling us? What God has revealed therein? Why this important caveat? 
this caveat because there may be information which was not revealed by God. Therefore, the people of gospel judge by what God has revealed therein. Bima anzal Allahu fihi. These are the Arabic words in the verse of the Quran. Bima anzal Allahu fihi. By what God has revealed therein. It is a very important caveat which Christian missionaries deliberately ignore and they pass through it conveniently without mentioning it. So there is a very important caveat. You the people of the gospel, whoever you are, if you claim to be the people of the original gospel of Jesus Christ, then judge by it. Okay? How do you judge by it now is the question. Yeah. It's, it's hilarious, yeah, Sam. This guy, he says that we, we just pass over the part where Allah says to judge by what Allah has revealed therein. When this yeah. is possibly the verse I've quote I've quoted most in my entire dealings with Islam. The other, it's possible it could, if you added up everything I've ever said, it's possible that Surah nine verse twenty nine or Surah five uh, Surah four verse one fifty seven uh, are the ones I've quoted most. But this is definitely top three. In fact. When I made my video years ago, which got either one or two million views, something like that, three Quran verses every Christian should know, this, chapter 5, verse 47, was on that list, and I most certainly do not gloss over, judge by what Allah has revealed therein, because what does the therein refer to, ladies and gentlemen? It refers yes. to the gospel, which it just mentioned. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein, if we're the people of the gospel, how do we judge by what Allah revealed in the gospel unless Allah grants and assumes and takes for granted, just like Muhammad did, that we have the gospel? He's got his response here, and he's about to go into 548 to explain how we're supposed to do this. But in 547, his response was, ah, but the Quran is only affirming the scripture given to Jesus. But no, Adnan, it can't simply be doing that because Allah says that Jews and Christians still have the gospel available in the seventh century. That's how we can that's how we can read it. So Adnan, if if Allah is saying that Christians have a book that Jesus gave, that Jesus wrote down, that's incoherent. And show me which of your scholars that you go to would agree with that and not laugh that off the stage. Yeah. So that's one thing. Two, the only way to reconcile this, Adnan, the only way to reconcile this is the Quran is affirming two things. One, there's a gospel that Jesus gave. Guess what? Christians agree with that. Jesus came with the gospel. Jesus preached the gospel. Two, Christians have texts that we call the gospel. And so we have a book that we call the gospel, and the Quran is affirming the text that we have. So you can either say that Allah just doesn't know what he's talking about. He he thinks that Christians have a book that was written by Jesus, in which case, great, your God is false. He has no clue what he's talking about. Or you can reconcile those two claims, and we already talked about them earlier in this live stream. You can reconcile those claims in the exact same way Christians reconcile the use of the word gospel, namely by a person can come with the gospel and speak a message, or you can have a text which is called the gospel, and which is exactly what Christians do, right? Jesus preached the gospel. His followers preached the gospel. That's a spoken message. There's not a book popping out of their mouths, right? The gospel, the fourfold gospel, the text that's called the gospel in the seventh century consisted of at least the four gospels, if not the entire New Testament. So if Allah's telling Christians you have this book, guess what? They didn't have a book that came that, that was revealed to Jesus. Right. So either your, your options are that the book, the four Gospels, the Quran is treating as the revelation to Jesus, which is fine, but it contradicts your religion. Or the Quran is affirming th that Jesus came with the gospel and it's affirming the Christian book that they had in the seventh century. Either way, the Quran is affirming the book that Christians still had in yeah. the seventh century. We know what the book is. The book completely destroys your religion. Ball game. What do you think, Sam? No. <clears throat> Just remember this, Christians. Please remember this. We are saying a lot. We're trying to go as fast as we can, but not too fast, so that you can understand the point. Adnan admitted, go back, listen carefully. He admits that the gospel of 547, you go back to the previous verse, because that gospel in 547 is what is mentioned in 546. It's the gospel of Christ. So notice, he is trying to say that when it says, let the people of the gospel judge about what God has revealed in it, he is connecting it with the previous verse. But then he wants to say that it's not referring to the four gospels, but the gospel of Jesus. But hold on, as David 
beautifully <clears throat> summed it up. How are you going to tell Christians to judge by a gospel of Christ if they don't have access to it? And why couldn't Allah communicate the point that you think he's making in the manner you did? Adnan, couldn't have Allah has simply said, and we are not referring to the four gospels. Did he know that they had four gospels? Or even not mention four. We are not referring to your gospels. We're referring to the gospel of Jesus, which you have twisted by your pen, which you have shredded, but parts of it remain in, in it. And it's those parts that remain in it that you judge by. Couldn't Allah have said what you said, Adnan? Why are you adding words to the text? Guys, notice, the things he said about the text are not in the text. The text doesn't say the four gospels are not the gospel. That's his insertion. The text doesn't say only remnants of the gospel of Jesus are to be found at the time of Muhammad. None of those things are stated by the plain reading of the Quran, which is supposed to be the speech of Allah, which is supposed to be perfect, unmatchable, and no one can speak more clearly or better than Allah or his messenger. But like David has been saying, Allah actually wanted to say, it's not your four gospels. Remnants of the original gospel still remain, but not all of it. But he came out saying something opposite to what he wanted to say, leaving it for Adnan to help his God and his prophet to express themselves in a more eloquent, precise manner. Way to go, Adnan. Yeah, Adnan, you're doing a great job proving that Allah is the best of worst communicators. Wow. That's why the guy said, Andy Shannon, Adnan is a special kind of stupid. But let's go to 548 because this is going to be his nightmare. 548. It's what I've been waiting for in Jesus' Yeah, name. guys, I, I, have to, I have to emphasize. See, it's... Uh, when, 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 when we toss out a challenge, show us a, a single unequivocal verse in the Quran which says that the gospel has been corrupted. We know what their responses are. We wouldn't toss out a challenge like that if we didn't already know what their exactly. response is because we know their sources. We know, the, we know the Quran. We know their responses to this stuff. So we know it. We've been interacting with, with uh, Muslim apologists for years. But we know where they're going, right? And we want them to go certain places. And one of the places we really, we really want them to go is Surah 5, verse 48, because it Man, does not, for... it does not. But we want everyone, we want Christians and Muslims to understand this passage, Surah 5, verse 43, to Surah 5, verse 48. We want people to understand that. We want Christians to understand it. We want Muslims to understand it. We want atheists to understand it. Because once you understand that passage, chapter 5, verse 43 to chapter 5, verse 48, once you really get that passage down, and guys, you should read it over and over and over and over and over again until you know it inside out. Once you have that passage, you can, you can destroy Islam based on that passage. And Muslims, you, should, you should leave Islam based on that passage. On that passage alone. That's why we're spending time. And that's why it's absolutely hilarious that Adnan goes here. He goes to chapter 5, verse 48. And that's why we haven't been talking about it. We, we've been waiting, right? We respond to everything else he says. And guess what? As Sam pointed out earlier, that's why Adnan waited so long to go here. He knows what we're going to do with this verse. He knows He knows who he's talking to. He knows what, he knows what Sam Shamoon is going to do with this verse. But he had no he had no choice because he's running out of places to go. So I think he just had to hope. I'm gonna say this to my followers. I'm gonna say, yep, chapter five, verse forty eight refutes them, and hope that we actually get bored responding to him and don't address it. He had to be hoping that because he does not want Sam Shamoon going through this passage. All right, you guys ready? Let's go in Jesus' name. Let's do it. A confusion may arise. That how do we judge by it if we don't have it? If we don't have the now the Quran confirms that there are remnants of that gospel in your hands. Whatever you have scattered all over the Christian world or in Christian libraries from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth century onwards, whatever you have in literature, there are remnants. And how do we know these remnants are the remnants of the original gospel of Jesus Christ? We know that by looking at the Quran because in the very next verse, verse number 48 of chapter 5, the Quran categorically states, We sent the scripture in truth. The Quran, by the way, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ O oh, Muhammad, we have sent down a book upon you, بِالْحَقِّ Okay, with truth. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ And we, and this book confirms what went before you. 
what went before you of the scripture. In other words, the previous scriptures. This book confirms what went before you. Okay, what does it confirm? Muhayminan. So this book is actually a guardian over the previous scriptures. It is a guardian over the previous scriptures. In other words, that's why Fahkum Bainahum Bima Anzal Allah. Therefore, O Muhammad, you judge by what God has revealed upon you. The, the Quran. The, no, no, he, he goes on. So we can, uh, I don't know if you wanted to sort of watch all the clips and then respond to everything sure. or, or respond to them one at a time, but, but just notice. The Quran stands as guardian over the previous scriptures. That's why I'm going to say they've all been corrupted and just go through and pick and choose what I like out of them because the Quran is, is such a great guardian over those scriptures. Yeah. Now, how should we do this, Sam? Should we go through everything yeah. he says and then respond to all of it? Or you want to yeah. take it piece by piece? Does he does he have more to say about this? Yeah. Okay, let me just make one comment, the dishonesty. And real quick, because I want to hear it fully by the grace of Jesus Christ. Guys, this is where you got to get in the saddle, get ready, trusting the Spirit to fill us, because this is the end of Islam for the glory of Jesus. Okay, mm -hmm. just one thing real quickly. I want you to see the dishonesty, the trickery, the deceit again. He even read the verse. Did you hear what the verse said? It says, <laughs> to you, Muhammad, we sent down the book in truth, confirming, he even quoted the Arabic, Musaddiqan lima bayna yadehi. Yeah, he quoted Confirming it. <laughs> what is between your hands and guarding over it, so you judge between them. Now, notice what the verse did not say. It did not say, this book we sent to you, Muhammad, give it to the Jews and Christians to use as the criterion to then determine which parts of the Torah and the gospel that they should look to and use to judge. That's what he's trying to, to deceive his audience into thinking. What is his point? See, 548 is the criterion to tell Jews and Christians which parts of the Bible are corrupt, which parts of the Bible are uncorrupt. That's exactly the opposite point. Mm -hmm. 548 is not even talking to the Jews and Christians anymore. Mm -hmm. It told the Christians what they're supposed to do. Guys, understand the context. It's telling Christians, you follow the gospel. Jews, you follow the Torah. Now it's addressing Muhammad and his ummah. Now when it comes to you guys, you Muhammad, you have the Quran. He wants to take 548, which is about how Muslims and Muhammad are to judge and what standard they're to live by, and then say, see, the Quran is the criterion for the Christians to know which parts of the gospel remain intact and to judge by. Do you see the dishonesty and the deceit of the way he's interpreting this passage? Yeah, and Sam, you brought up that he even said he even quoted it in Arabic. I want the yes. Arabs here, the Arab speakers, Christian or Muslim, anyone there who speaks Arabic, to confirm what Sam just pointed out. The Quran is said to confirm that which is bina yadehi, bina yep. yadehi. What does that mean? Does that mean as and not as the translation has it, that which came before? Because Anand, because notice that's what Muslim translations do. They say that which that which came before, um, and they say you see it's it's saying yeah it came before in the past, but it, you know it was later corrupted. Is that what Baina Yadehi means? So just confirm, yeah. just confirm Arab Christians or yeah. Muslims, anyone who's honest, tell us what yep. Baina Yadehi means. Between us, and then don't forget the verb musaddiqan, mm -hmm. sadaka. And watch when I get into Tabari and see what Al Tabari says about this word, Lord Jesus willing, right shortly thereafter. So you catch it? You, Muhammad, this book confirms what is between your hands, his hands. Mm -hmm. What's between your hands, Muhammad? Stupid. Didn't you read the verses before and after? Yeah. Ch the verses before. To our gospel. Hello. Check out, check out what we have here. Energy says between your hands. Uh uh, Muhammad says what's in their hands right now. It's talking about what's in their hands right now. Uh, e Evangelion Production says that between their hands. Um, Nathan says, I'm an Arab. It's between, it's, uh, Nathan says, let's see, between his hands, I'm Arab. Uh, Axel says between his hand. And so we have plenty of people here who know this is saying between his hands uh, or between its hands. And so this is not saying something that existed centuries ago but was corrupted and you no longer have exactly. it it's talking it about there. it's talking about what's there and by the way this is a this is a, a side note uh because Anand just glossed right over this part sam yes in the verse that talks about jesus confirming the torah 
there, doesn't it say that Jesus confirmed the Torah? Yes. The Torah between his hands? In fact, not only says Jesus confirms it, it says his gospel confirms it. In chapter 5, verse 46, folks, it says, and in their footsteps, guys, chapter 5, verse 46, just two verses earlier, and in their first steps, we send Jesus, the son of Mary, Musaddiqin, guys, you Arabic speakers, tell me how my Arabic is, because I speak Assyrian. Musaddiqin lima bayna yadehi min el-Torati, to el-Torati. Musaddiqin, Musaddiqin sadaqa, right? Bayna yadehi min el-Torati, el-Torat. Okay, it says he does that, and we gave him the gospel, there in his guidance and light, Musaddiqin bayna yadehi, bayna yadehi, I want to even dance to that, bayna yadehi, between his hands, min el-Torat. Okay, little translation. Jesus and his gospel confirm the Torah between his hands, which is an idiomatic phrase meaning that which he could touch, pick up, mm -hmm. and read. That's what Jesus and his gospel did. The yep. very thing that Muhammad's Quran is supposed to do two verses later. Yeah, the, the burning lion says, Baina Yadehi means between his hands. It's basically used as what they have, what they, what they have. And so notice, Muslims, this is why we say, you got to learn this passage and Christians, you also need to learn this passage. Adnan wants to say the Torah has been corrupted and the gospel has been corrupted. And the Quran is saying that the Torah and the gospel have been corrupted. Well, he's the one, he's the one who, who cited chapter five, verse 46, where Jesus and his gospel are said to confirm the Torah between his hands. Why is this relevant? Well, guess what? If the Torah after 14 centuries, the Torah goes 14 centuries and gets to the time of Jesus. And we have copies of the Torah from before the time of Jesus. And after the time of Jesus, we know what the Torah at the time of Jesus said. Jesus confirms it and his revelations confirm it. What does Anan say? Nope, it's been corrupted. Then just two verses later, the Quran is said to confirm the scriptures that they already have, the scriptures that, are, that already exist in its own time. And Anan is going to say, nope, it's, a, it's only affirming certain remnants and saying that the rest has all been corrupted. So it, it's, Sam, it's like when Allah says, Sam, think about this, right? Allah says over and over again in the Quran to the Jews, I'm affirming what you have. I'm affirming the revelation with you. He says that he inspired the, the Torah, that he protects the Torah, that Jews have to judge by the Torah. The Jews have no ground to stand upon unless they stand upon the Torah. Muhammad points to a copy of the Torah, says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. He says that Jews have the Torah. And Jesus confirms the Torah. Jesus confirms the Torah that existed between his hands. And the Quran comes just two verses later and says, yep, I'm confirming that Torah as well. It's like Allah is saying, guys, how many different ways can I tell you that I'm affirming that book? How right. many, how, how clear can the perfectly clear <laughs> communicator possibly make this? I'm saying it in 50 different ways. I'm telling you in 50 different ways uh -huh. that I'm affirming that book. I'll, uh, and then you have a nun comes along and says, yep, it's categorically saying you can't trust that book except for certain parts, which I'm going to decide uh -huh. what they are. This is amazing. Guys, this is Islam. This is why we keep saying these guys are apostates. They're apostates. They do not realize it. Sam, according to the Quran, if a person rejects what Allah and Muhammad have said, are they Muslims, according to the Quran? No, chapter 4, verse 65, it's over for you. In fact, if you're living at the time of Omar, he would behead you. He would chop off your neck with the sword. That's mm -hmm. chapter 4, verse 65. Read Ibn Kathir's interpretation of what Umar did to someone who didn't submit to Muhammad completely. Mm -hmm. Right there. It's All over right. what you did now. And, uh, and no, look, we even have con confirmation from Nona Bubble here. Nona Bubble is sort of a, a struggling Muslim. And Nona Bubble says, between hands. Baina, baina means between. Yadehi means yeah. it's hands. Right? So, yeah. All right. Yeah, so we even... So no question that the Quran is affirming the scriptures that still exist in its own time, between its hands, in its presence. And so, yeah, Snow Leopard points out, it's this is this is all present tense stuff, right? It's not talking about scriptures that haven't existed 
for centuries. It's not talking about that stuff. So guys, this is, and keep in mind, and the point is you cannot accuse Adnan of being ignorant of this. He just read it in Arabic. Arabic he knows exactly. what it says in Arabic. He knows that the Quran is affirming, not some corrupt Torah and God, not some remnants. He's confirming the Torah and the gospel that still exists during the time of Muhammad, which Adnan is saying have already been corrupted and they're, you know, they're just pieces of truth left. This is amazing, man. This is amazing. You can't make this yep. stuff up. Yeah. All right, should we sure. go on and see what else he says? Yeah, man, uh, because this is going to be the end of Islam. I promise you guys, when we're done, by the grace of Jesus Christ, Adnan's career is over. He's going to yeah. be a waste of time because he's got no response anymore. All right, here we go. So if you read these verses in context, what God is telling us in these verses and telling the Christians and the Jews is that God revealed the Torah upon Moses and the Jews have some parts of it. Okay? Judge by it. Whatever God has revealed and whatever, whatever has survived, judge by it. Okay? We reveal the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? Judge by whatever has remained of it. One may question as to what God is talking about in chapter 5 verse 47 when he tells the people of the gospel to judge by what God has revealed therein. A Muslim commentator, Ibn Kathir, states that God is telling the people of the gospel to judge by what he has revealed therein by looking at those passages that are confirmed by God. For example, the Quran tells us that the Jews and the Christians find Prophet Muhammad mentioned with them in the scripture. This is clearly stated in chapter 7 of the Quran, verse, 100 and, uh, verse 157. All right, so now we have Anand's position in all its glory. Uh, and he goes to Ibn Kathir, who comes centuries after the time. Notice, oh, yeah. he, he can't <laughs> notice him. 700 years plus after Muhammad. He's coming in the 14th, 15th century Hijra. He's over 700 years from the time of Muhammad's reported death. Notice what he does. And what Allah is telling us here, let's go to Ibn Kathir, who by his time, Muslims were well aware of the fact that the exactly. Quran completely contradicts the Torah and the gospel. And so they're going to have to interpret it. Let me go to here. I can't quote Allah saying this. I can't, I can't quote Muhammad saying this, but I'm going to quote Ibn Kathir saying this because that's where I have to go to get some confirmation of this. So what, Sam, what, what Allah is trying to do here, right? Now notice what, what he, what, when you read the passage, when you read the passage, Jews come to Muhammad, Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. Allah says, Jews, what are you coming to Muhammad for? What are, they, what are you coming to Muhammad for when you've got the Torah? And the historical background, Muhammad, in the historical background, Muhammad takes a copy of the Torah and says, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. And then we have the revelation to Jesus. And Jesus is said, Jesus is said to confirm the revelation, the previous revelation that was still between his hands, meaning that it had been preserved. And then Christians are told that they have to judge by the gospel. The gospel, according to verse 46, confirms the Torah that still exists during the time of the gospel. Christians are told to judge by the gospel. Then, notice the progression, Allah sends the, the Quran to Muslims, which confirms the revelations that still exist, the revelations between his hands that still exist. So the Torah comes, Jews still have it, that's why they need to judge by it. If you're in doubt, guess what, Christians? You're Christ you Christians, Jesus and his revelations confirm their books. They don't reject their book. Their book is the word of God too. That's why they need to judge by that book. Christians, you have this book and you have to judge by your book. Chapter five, verse 47, you have to judge by, the, by that book. And Muslims, if you're sitting here thinking about rejecting the prior revelations, no, 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 no. The Quran is confirming the revelations that the Christians have that they have to judge by. Both revelations, the gospel, and the Quran affirm the Torah. So all of these revelations are confirming each other. And that's why you can't throw any of them out. Jews have their revelation. They need to judge by Christians have their revelations. They need to judge by Muslims have their revelations. They need to judge by Adnan looks at all of this and says, yes, the Quran is saying that there are simply little parts of truth still left in the Torah, still left in the gospel. And that, that Jews and Christians, need to find those parts. How? By going to the Quran and seeing what lines up with Islam. And anytime they find something that lines up with Islam, well, that's good. Anything that doesn't line up with Islam, throw that out. Notice how Adnan is using his methodology to confirm his methodology. Adnan's methodology is to go to his Quran, pick any parts he likes and throw out the rest. 
His methodology with the Bible is to go to the Bible, pick any up, pick out any parts he likes, throw out the rest. Go to scholars, find any any comment by any scholar that he agrees with, take that, and then throw out the rest. He goes to the he goes to Muhammad's companions, picks anything he said that he agrees with, then throws out the rest. That's his methodology. And notice how he's reading his methodology into the Quran to say that that's the methodology that Allah is saying to use, right? Allah is telling Jews to use this methodology. Go to your scriptures, find everything that lines up with Islam, throw out the rest. He's telling Christians to use this methodology. Go to your gospel, find everything that lines up with Islam, throw out the rest. Adnan, I, I, Sam, I, it can't be any more clear than this that these guys are apostates and idolaters. Ma he's made an idol out of himself. He's imposing his own methodology, which Allah does nothing but Allah does nothing but condemn this picking and choosing methodology in the Quran. He condemns Jews for doing this. He condemns Muslims for doing this. He condemns this methodology. And Allah says, no, this is actually the methodology that Allah is commanding everyone to use. He's making an idol out of the most ridiculous, inconsistent, hypocritical method anyone hmm. has ever used. Notice, you could use this method to defend anything, right? I could say, the, I could say the Bhagavad Gita says that I'm a prophet. And I could go, and well, how are we going to find this, David? Well, simple. Anything you find in there that agrees with me, keep that. Throw out all the rest, and you'll see that it does nothing but confirm me. What a stupid, idiotic methodology. Yeah. And this is the heart of Islam that is used by its greatest apologists. Ladies and gentlemen, how can this be the truth? I'm getting all of this out of the way because I know Sam is about yep. to wreak absolute... <laughs> havoc on this sam you have it chapter Glory 5 verse Christ. 48 tell us yes. does it say what adnan says it says okay folks i know you've been here waiting patiently i think it's been close to three hours or over two hours and we still got 50 under glory to jesus that means you're hungry for truth and you want to learn so bear with me i'm going to go slow and i'm going to have david interject to repeat or reiterate or clarify my point lest i confuse you let me start with a modern source i'm not going to give you my interpretation I'm going to look at modern Muslim scholars, and I'm going to look at the classical Muslim scholars, and any Arabic-speaking Christian, and if there's a Muslim who's going to be honest, will admit. I even watched a recent lecture by Yasser Qadi on his Sirah, uh, series on the uh, Prophet of Muhammad, the Sirah, on Zainab, and he says, his own mouth, Al-Tabri, the greatest commentator in Islam, Al-Tabri. So I'm going to look at Al-Tabri. I'm gonna, well, I won't look at Ibn Kathir now because that will be too much time. But guys, pay attention. I'm now going to read the study Quran. The study Quran, it's a modern Quranic translation produced by Muslim scholars. Some are converts to Islam. And <clears throat> this is the first Quran that has study notes. It's called the study Quran. Let me read how they explain the word Muhammad, chapter 5, verse 48. These are modern Muslim scholars. And then I'm going to look at Tabari, and I'm going to show you how everything Adnan said backfires against him, decimating Islam, destroying the Quran, exposing Muhammad as an inconsistent fraud, Jesus Christ is Lord. Here, let me read it. It's a lengthy citation, but bear with me, because you're here to learn. Here's their commentary on 548. This verse addresses the Prophet directly and describes the book sent down to him, that is the Quran, as confirming the book that came before it, just as the gospel confirms the Torah. The Quran is also described as confirming earlier scriptures. In chapter 2, verse 41, David, why are they quoting the same verses we've been quoting? Chapter 2, verse 41, mm -hmm. chapter 2, verse 89, chapter 2, verse 91, chapter 2, verse 97, chapter 2, verse 101, chapter 3, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 81. Man, they, they, they give more than I did. Chapter 6, verse 92, chapter 35, 31, chapter 46, verse 30. They sound like us, and yet they're Muslim scholars. Okay, now, the Quran is further described as protector, Muhammad, over the previous scriptures. Folks, notice their interpretation. Muslim scholars. Okay, Meaning that the Quran testifies to the validity of the earlier scriptures and serves as their trustee, keeper, and guardian. And then you put in parentheses, Tabari Zamakhshari. They're getting this from Tabari Zamakhshari. Protector is also one of the names of God in the Quran. 
The idea of the cross as guardian and keeper of previous revelations is consistent with 5, verse 41c, and chapter 5, verse 45c, which report that the prophet ordered the sentence of stoning for the two idolaters, as well as retribution for killing and injury, in order to reestablish the original Torah ruling on these matters. When it means original Torah, they're not saying corrupt. It was there in the Torah, but they discarded it. So Muhammad is saying, no, no, no. It says it in your Torah, this copy, do it. Okay. When the prophet judges between them, that is the people of the book, this verse enjoins them to do so in accordance with what God has sent down, which most major commentators understand to mean that he should judge according to what God had revealed to him, namely the Quran. Alternately, alternately, it can mean that he should judge the people of the book according to what God has sent down to them. Bam! Wait, 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 Muslim scholars. You haven't been speaking to not have you. You haven't consulted him. Shame on you. He's God's gift to apologetics. Alternately, let me repeat it again. Alternately, it can mean that he, sh he should judge the people of the book according to what God has sent down to them. Use their books to judge them, which he actually did. Namely, their own scriptures, which is what the prophet explicitly does in the incident discussed in verses 41 to 43, that he should not follow their caprices, meaning that he should not rule in accordance with their unwarranted digressions from or alterations to their own law, as discussed in verses 41 47. Now, watch this. Although verses 41 47 taken together, guys, please listen. Although verses 41 47, we start at 43, they're starting at 41, taken together suggest the validity of Jews and Christians judging by their own scriptures and thus the continuing spiritual guidance to be found in those scriptures. This verse goes farther says even more than that mm. by asserting the providential nature and differing religious communities and their distinct laws and practices indeed the verse does not pertain only to jews and christians but rather makes a universal statement about all religions for each among you we've appointed a law and a way indicates that different religious communities may have different ritual and legal formulations specifically appointed for them by God, and that each religious community is independent of the laws of other such communities, even if the essential truths and principles of the religions are the same. End quote. David, does this sound like these Muslim scholars think Mohammed means to expose what's corrupt in the Bible or remains intact? Um, no, and it, it'll be difficult to find anyone who who actually just based on the language that's used, who isn't trying to force an interpretation into the Quran would ever come up with that meaning, especially since it completely contradicts everything else Allah says. And so once again, we can conclude if, if that's what Allah was saying, he was so hopelessly unclear that even Muslim commentators don't understand what in the world he's saying. They don't understand that he, he's only saying what Anand came along and said, you know, 14 centuries later. Uh, so here again, Allah is the worst communicator of all time. If that, yeah. if, if he's trying to say what Adnan said, then he's the worst communicator of all time. And notice, guys, just the absurdity of the idea that the way Allah communicates is to say something that doesn't sound anything remotely like what he wants to say, and then someone has to come along 14 centuries later and explain what he means by inserting a bunch of words that he didn't say, and that exactly. this is the correct way to interpret the Quran. This is Islam. This is this is why we're this is why we're all supposed to believe in Islam. And this is a God who constantly brags throughout the Quran that he's perfectly clear in his speech, and he's the worst communicator of all time, according to what Anand says. Sam, that's why I have a comment on the screen. It says, "I laud you and Sam for treating the Islamic texts with more integrity than Muslims." Amen. Yep. And let me say why we do that. And I'm going to go to Tabari. We're almost done, but I got to quote Tabari. You know why I do that? Even though we fail to love Jesus the way we should, even though we strive to because he deserves perfect love and devotion, our desire, our aim is to honor Jesus who said he's the truth. And we do not honor Jesus by lying, by conniving, by twisting what even other worldviews and religions teach because Jesus commands us, speak the truth at all costs, even to our own hurt because he doesn't need us to lie, because Jesus is God on the throne. He doesn't need debaters and apologists to help him out. He's almighty to save and sovereign over creation. And that's our desire. 
to honor the Lord by being truthful and love him and speak the truth at all costs, even if it costs us our lives, because Jesus is worthy, because he's the truth. Guys, now it gets better. David, it gets better. You ready? Mm-hmm. And actually, what's ironic, the Muslims do say this word, Muhammad, they're all over the map. Mm-hmm. And by the way, Arabic Christians, you can confirm this because Muslims will be reticent to admit this. Is it not true that you can look at Tabari, Qurtubi, Ibn Kathir, Zamakhshari, you look at their commentary on any verse and they'll give you two to three to four to five different opinions because the Muslims could not agree on the exact meaning of of any verse in the Quran. Ironically, even with chapter 112 of the Quran, Surah Al-Ikhlas, they're all over the map. And yet the Quran claims to be plain Arabic. Now this is coming from the post. The link is in the description box. At the bottom, I linked to two articles that are more thorough because I had to condense Tabari's citations and only quoted those parts that are relevant. Tabari, considered to be one of the greatest and not greatest Muslim scholars. Guys, let's get ready to rumble. Al Tabari, look what he says. Regarding Muhammad. And by the way, Tabari is way earlier than Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir is about 700 years plus after Muhammad. Al Tabari is writing around, if I recall, 10th century, 900, about 300 years after Muhammad. So he's much earlier and closer, even though he's not early enough. Regarding Muhammad, Allah says that he brought down the book to you, O Muhammad, believing in the books that came before it and a witness to them that they are the truth from Allah. Wait, 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 Tabari, what? The Quran is a witness to these books that they are the truth from Allah, faithful to them, and a protector to them. The root of Haymana means to protect and watch over. That is why it is said when a man watches over something and protects, it has, he has Haymana over it. The present form of the verb is you Hayman, and the noun is Haymana. Now watch what he admits. Based on what we have mentioned, the people of interpretation have differed. Guys, pay attention. Anand trying to make it seem that his interpretation is the most obvious meaning, the only meaning possible. But <coughs> Tabari, Al Tabari, I keep omitting the definite article, Al Tabari says, the people of interpretation have differed in their explanation of this word. For some said that it means to be a witness. So then he quotes those that say it's a witness. Now notice some of the authorities he cites. Narrated by Al Qasim, narrated by Al Hussein, narrated by Hajjaj, narr- narrated Ibn Juraj, narr- narrated by Mujahid, who rated that Muhammad, Muhammad over it means the Quran is a protector and a witness and a confirmer, a confirmer of the previous scriptures. Ibn Juraj and others said that the Quran is a guardian over the previous books. So that the people of the books mention an issue that was also mentioned in the Quran, it is to be believed, otherwise it will not be believed. Now watch this. It was narrated by Muhammad ibn Sa'd, narrated by his father, narrated by his uncle, by Ibn Abbas. We brought down upon you the book, in truth, confirming what is between your hands from the book, refers to the Quran, which is a witness to the Torah and the Gospel and confirms both of them. So here they're saying Muhammad means it witnesses, it bears witness that the Torah and the Gospel are truth and confirms their validity. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to go to the other opinion because I'm almost done with this. Others have said that Muhammad means to confirm, meaning believe in. Of those who mention this opinion are narrated by Yunus, narrated by Ibn Wahab, narrated by Ibn Zayyid, who said that Muhammad means to confirm it. Everything Allah has given in the Torah or the Gospel or the Psalms, the Quran believes in it. One more time. Everything Allah has given in the Torah or the Gospel or the Psalms, the Quran believes in it. So it believes in it. It confirms it. It doesn't expose corruption to it. Now I'm adding those commentaries. Now, here's the one that's really the nightmare. End of story, Adnan. Your career is over. Here's the end of story. Others have said that we brought down upon you the book in truth confirming what is between your hands from the book, refers to the prophet of Allah. Of those who mention this opinion are, narrated by Al-Mathni, narrated by Abu Huthayfa, narrated by Shibl, narrated by Ibn Abu Nujay, narrated by Mujahid, who stated Muhammad over it refers to Muhammad, 
who is entrusted with the Quran. Guys, end of story. What do I mean? If Muhaymanin refers to Muhammad's role over the Quran, guys, notice what Adnan just did. Here's the, the end of Islam. Here's what I want you to get, and I'm done. Now, I got more citations, but this is sufficient. Adnan wants to say the word Muhammad means that the Quran tells Jews and Christians which parts of the Bible are corrupt, which parts are intact. Adnan, you just buried the Quran because according to some, Muhammad is Muhammad over the Quran, meaning it's referring not to the Quran being a guardian over the Bible, but Muhammad's role in guarding the Quran. So if Muhammad means that the job of that entity that's called Muhammad is to expose corruptions to a specific thing, Adnan, you just admit the Quran is corrupt, it's been destroyed, distor uh, distorted, it's been shredded like the Quran says, and Muhammad's role was to say, this part of the Quran remains intact, that part is corrupt, it's not from Allah. Thank you, Adnan, for now proving that your Quran is corrupt and Muhammad was sent to show which parts were corrupt, which parts are to be rejected, which parts are not from Allah, but maybe from Satan, like the satanic verses, verses if your definition of Muhammad is correct. Um, there you go, Dave. So, once again, once again, we have the problem of Adnan's methodology, which he is trying to force on everyone else, including Jews and Christians, that his method, notice, as Sam pointed out, the interpretations of this verse are all over the place, are all over the place, based on the words that are used. This is the ongoing strategy of Muslim apologists. Go to verses that can have all kinds of meanings, and therefore, if they're so incredibly ambiguous that you can insert any meaning into them you want, then go to those verses as the authoritative verses on whatever topic you're talking about and use those verses to insert your own meaning into them and then ignore every single clear verse on the subject that refutes you and calls you a liar. That's the method, right? We see that over and over again. Does Surah 2, verse 79, if you read it in context, say anything about the corruption of the Torah? No, not at all. It can't possibly mean that. What does Adnan do? He goes and he reads the corruption of the Torah into the verse. Surah 5, verse 48 of the Quran. Does this say one word about the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians being corrupted and only having remnants of truth and using the Quran to go in there and figure out the parts that agree with Islam and then judging by those? Not one word. He inserts that into there, and then he completely ignores all the verses that refute him. He does this over and over and over again, and then he tries to tell Jews and Christians that's what we have to do with, with, our, with our books. We have to insult and degrade the Almighty in this way. We have, to, we have to go, sorry, God, you couldn't do a good job of saying what you mean and preserving your word, so we'll just, we'll just pick and choose based on the revelations of a guy who also couldn't say what he meant and who, who couldn't get it across. And he says we have to pick and choose, and so we're going to pick and choose. And, of course, that God couldn't even say what he meant until Adnan Rashid came along and, uh, yeah. and then explained things to him. But that's what we need to, we need to base our, our religious beliefs on and not, not base them on the risen Lord, the one who conquered yeah. death. This Amen. is so incredibly stupid. Yeah. It should be embarrassing to, to Muslims around the world. Yeah, and just let me make one final point. At most, and this is in my post, at most, if you want to argue that Muhammad means a quality control agent, because that's what he's arguing for, that it's the criterion to determine you know, some, you know, whether something is valid or invalid, at most, in the context, folks, and this is not my interpretation, this interpretation of the sources I cited, you know what it means in the context of chapter 5, verses 43, 48? And I want you to get this. It's in the articles. Study them. Use them for the glory of Jesus because game over for Adnan. He did his best. He failed miserably because he had no choice but to fail because he's defending a lie from the pit of hell. Jesus is Lord. He's alive. And you can never dethrone King Jesus. And Muhammad is under the feet of Jesus. Here's what it means, basically. This is what it's basically saying. It's saying, Muhammad, you've already told the Jews to judge by the Torah. You've already told the Christians to judge by the gospel. Because the Torah and the gospel are their sources of legislation and are authoritative for them. And they won't follow you. Okay. 
You, however, you got the Quran. You go by the Quran, and the Quran will then serve as the means by which to know how much of the previous legislation is binding on you and your community and how much of it you've been freed from. In other words, the verb is not referring to corruption to the text. That's a misinterpretation. Read the verse itself. It says, to each people we've given away and legislation. In other words, it's saying, for you, the Quran will tell you whether stoning is still valid for your community. The Torah told Moses, stone adulterers. The Quran will tell you, keep that. The Torah says, don't eat camel meat. The Quran says, no, you can eat camel meat. In other words, it's not saying the text is corrupt. It's simply telling Muhammad, use the Quran to determine how much of the previous laws you are bound to follow and how much you've been freed from. And this is similar to what the Quran says Jesus' function was. In chapter 3, verse 50, guys, re-listen to this until you understand these arguments, because I promise you, glory to Jesus, these arguments are irrefutable. Islam is over if you learn them and know how to use them properly. In chapter 3, verse 50, it says the same thing about Jesus. Jesus reportedly says, I confirm the Torah between my hands, right? Musaddiqin lima baina yadayya, between my hands. And I make lawful to you that which was forbidden. See, this is what Muhammad is supposed to do. Like Jesus said it to his followers, the Torah is God's uncorrupt words. However, I have authority to set you free from some of its prohibitions. Likewise, that's what the Quran is saying to Muhammad. Muhammad, testify that the scriptures they have, uncorrupt, preserved, infallible. No corruption. They are the true words of God, preserved. Since they don't believe in you, tell them to follow that. You, however, use the Quran to determine... Do you still stone adulterers or not? Do you eat camel meat or not? Do you observe the Sabbath or not? That's all it's saying. Game over, Adnan. Game over for your prophet. Game over for your Quran. Game over for your God. Jesus lives. He is risen. And he's the Lord of glory. End of story. It's done. Surprise, Adnan. Now, Sam, w w watch what happens when we. Uh, so we have we have the Muslims who constantly try to distract and change the subject, and then we have these, which are pro which which are uh, on almost every live stream. There'll be a Muslim who comes along and says something like this: "Thank you very much, David. You make my faith more strong about Islam. I study your points against Islam, then did research, which shows you are a great liar, completely wrong, and you know it, but you haven't." Um, Tanvir. I I I don't know if you know how, how common this is for Muslims to sort of puff themselves up when their beliefs are being absolutely wrecked and when their apologists are being wrecked. Hmm. You constantly come along and say, ah, but 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 I've researched this and, and you're lying. Notice, Sam, how many times have we actually just stopped and said, okay, you just said we lied. What did we lie about? And they can't okay. mention a single thing, right? Uh, but uh, but uh, Tanvir, this uh, this common Muslim thing where whenever your prophet and book are getting wrecked, you say, oh, you're just strengthening my confidence. I've been seeing that since the first Muslims I ever talked to. Nabil was like that, right? Nabil was getting strong. He, outward appearances, he was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. He told me later after he converted, he said, this was destroying me. It was exactly. destroying me learning all this stuff about Islam until he, he ultimately left it. So it's good that you're saying this, Tanvir, because when you're lying like this, uh, I mean, think about this. How would, how would us showing that your Quran affirms our scriptures and contradicts our scriptures, and that your apologists can only avoid this by constantly lying? How would that strengthen your faith? It's hmm. it's ridiculous, right? So we know what you're doing. You're puffing yourself up because it's a natural defense mechanism when your faith is being wrecked to pretend to be more devout because you know that you're not allowed to have doubts about Islam. But uh, Tanvir. I'm going to be nice here because we're nice. We're nice guys. Tell us what we lied about. We just spoke for three hours straight. Three hours straight we went. Tell us what we lied about. I'm giving you the opportunity. Golden opportunity. I'll put it up on the screen. Tell us what we lied about. And guys, if you see a comment that uh, I didn't see, other than that, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and log off. But uh, you have the opportunity now. Tell us what we lied about. And I'll put it up on the screen and you can expose us. Is that non's trying to expose us? He's doing a real bad job, but maybe you could do better. All right, Sam. Sam, you see any comments by him? 
I mean, um, nothing. I just I think you put him in sh- shock mode right now, and you by calling him out, you just put the fear of God in him. He's you like, can't, oh. you can't get more patient than to spend three know, hours man. going through. You can't get more patient than spending three hours going through Muslim claims one by one, exposing them, and then after all of it, say, okay, if we're wrong about something, if we lied about something, go ahead and show us right now. Go ahead and show and, us. And by go the way, ahead. I just want i want to just share something with you guys. Uh, honestly, I'll be honest. Uh, there he goes. He says, you tell that the earth is flat mentioned in the Quran. That's your lie. He just said that was your lie. Okay. Your, I just read it. So notice, it? notice, ladies and gentlemen, we didn't talk. We didn't say anything about that. Sam, is the, is the, is the earth flat according to the Quran? You better believe it. I have an article showing that the Arabic words used that the Quran and that's, teaches that's, a flat earth. That's not according to you. Over. That's not according no. to you. That's according to Muslim commentators yes. such, as, one. such as the uh, Tafsir Jalalain. Jalalain. Ta- Jalalain. Chapter 88, verse 20. And guys, Arabic speakers, chapter 88, verse 20. Just give you one of many. It says, and the earth, we have flattened it. Sutuhat. Uh, sutuhat. I'm sorry. Arabic speakers. Can you confirm in chapter 88, verse 20, that there the word sutuhat means to make the earth flat. Tafsir al says that this verse teaches that the earth is flat, not round as the astronomers teach. Yeah, c- c- Sam, just to be clear, this is one of the most popular Muslim commentaries of all time, the two Jalals. And they said, yes. they said what about the word that's used there, sutuhat? Sutuhat means, it means that the earth has been made flat and they said it's not round like the astro- astronomers teach see there it goes you got the arabic speaking christians confirming it Sutahat. so this Sutahat. is this see? is one flat, of the like this is one of the this is one of the most popular muslim commentaries of all time and notice they're saying here's what the word means here's what the word means and so this they're saying the quran is opposed to the view of the astronomers who think that it's 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 spherical yeah, that's Tafsir Jalalain. You can read online for free. Now notice, notice, notice what notice what Tanvir is saying. You tell the Earth is flat mentioned in the Quran. That's what we ask. That's what we ask for a lie. So he's telling us not only are we lying, Allah's lying, Muhammad's lying, and Muslim commentators are lying for saying that this clearly says that the Earth is flat. So, so Tanvir, <laughs> notice. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this you can't make this stuff up Sam. <laughs> he he, re, he responded Yes, earth is flat relative to us. So he admits it, okay. Yeah. Be... So So Tan, Tanvir, right. Tanvir. Tanvir, pay attention. Okay, he admit it, but it's to us, David. Now now Sam, now Sam, if if we also if we if we also go to um let's say Ibn Abbas where he's talking about the seven earths, doesn't he say Ooh. seven earths but they are flat? Yes, yes. Somebody okay. has a reference that says it. It's like there are seven heavens, seven earths that are all flat. And these are all in our articles, by the way. Go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Type in Quran flat earth. I got the citations free of charge, guys. Use it. Now, now, Sam, who, who is Ibn Abbas? Ibn Abbas, he's uh, some Josh. No, Ibn Abbas is Muhammad's first cousin. Considered one of the greatest Muslim expositors. The very one that Adnan Rashid misquoted and took his words out of context to make him say something he didn't mean to say. Mm-hmm. So let me let me let me get this straight, Sam. You've got Ibn Abbas, one of Muhammad's companions. He's commenting on the uh, on the Quranic claim that there are seven earths, and he says that there are seven earths. They're all flat. Se- se- so seven flat earths. Where's he getting the claim that the earth is flat from? Well, the Quran revealed that the earth is was laid out. It was sutahat laid, laid out flat laid out flat. And so he says it's flat. You've got Tafsir Jalalain, the two Jalals say it's flat. Um, and he spe- and in Tafsir Jalalain, they specifically say it's not a sphere like the like the uh, the astronomers say. It's flat. Allah clearly revealed that it's flat. Ibn Abbas says, yeah, the seven earths are are all flat. There's not one word here saying, well, you know, uh, relative to us. They're saying what the shape of the earth is. Think about this. A Muslim looks at all of this and we say, huh, this Quran verse sounds like it's saying that the earth is flat. Oh, Muhammad's companion, Ibn Abbas, who learned the Quran from Muhammad himself, he says it's flat. Let's go to the commentary. 
Tops here, Jala Lane says it's flat, and they're specifically saying it, it's not like it's not like the astronomers say it's flat. And Sam, we're the liars. We're the ones just be, are, just, be, just because we repeat what they say. Now, notice, ladies and gentlemen, we stopped. We just stopped everything we're doing. We weren't going to talk about this. It had nothing to do with the show. Tanvir says, David, you've really strengthened my face because I, my faith because you. I know you're a liar. And we say, okay. What have we lied about? His number one example, the number one example of something I lied about is saying that the Quran, according to the Quran, the earth is flat. And the Quran says that the earth is flat. It says Sutehat. You have Ibn Abbas, the father of, of Quranic studies, confirming that claim. And you have one of the greatest Muslim commentaries of all time. Tafsir Jalalain confirming the interpretation, but we're the ones lying. We're, we're lying when we say this stuff, ladies and gentlemen. Do you see the mentality? Do you see the mentality? You ain't lying, buddy. All you right, well, lying. Tanvir, you had, you, you had your chance. You stepped up to the plate. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Uh, come Dang. back next time. Come back next time. Maybe you'll have something better for us. But uh, <laughs> thanks for exposing. As if, as if three hours going through Adnan clips wasn't enough to expose the methodology of Islam. Uh, we had to get a little cherry on the uh, ice cream sundae there at the end. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we've been going over three hours, so we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, we're still getting tons of people watching on these weekends, so um, I'm assuming we'll be back weekend next Britain. weekend. Next weekend, as long yeah. as the coronavirus lockdown is going on, um, we will be happy to, uh, to go live on at least on, at least one day on the weekend. We'll go live earlier in the day um, so that so that Europeans can can tune in. Uh, Sam, any final thoughts? Yeah. yeah, just folks, if you memorize this information, learn it, make it second nature, and present it in your own way by the power of the Holy Spirit, I promise you, you'll destroy Islamic apologetics polemics. You will destroy the claims of Muhammad and the Quran because Muslims can't escape. Their false prophet confirmed the Bible, but the Bible exposes Muhammad as a false prophet, so their only choice is to leave Muhammad and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, or simply not follow any religion but they can't attack the bible anymore game over stop and that's another thing i want to encourage the christians not to do never debate muslims on the topic is the bible god's word because muhammad already sealed it for you muhammad already confirmed it is debate them did muhammad think the bible is the word of god and i promise you they'll run from that topic because they know deep down inside we've proven beyond any reasonable doubt Muhammad confirms the Bible, and they understand this destroys Islam and shows Muhammad is an antichrist and that Jesus is Lord. He's alive. May he bless us, preserve us, and our loved ones, and my daughters, for his glory, in Jesus' name. So Christ is risen. Love you guys, and pray for us. In Jesus name. All right, guys. Well, uh, do not know what the next plans are, but if you want us to go through any specific clips for next time, let us know what those are. Now, keep in mind, you can't post links it was some Muslim friends who kept posting links to porn, uh, who stopped, who who forced me to block uh, the ability to share links. Although I think moderators can share links, but you can always tell us the name of a video and who it's by, if you'd like, uh, if you'd like us to go through what your uh, what you whatever you're watching. Uh, be happy to now that we have the technology to watch video clips, and we're happy to go oh. through continue exposing. What's up? Yeah. Don't forget, tonight, if you guys are interested, I'm going to be doing a live stream with a Catholic apologist named William Albrecht, A-L-B-R-E-C-H-T, William Albrecht. You look look up the link at so, my social media on Facebook because I forgot the name of the YouTube session, but it's going to be 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11 p.m., so it's a light, late one. So if you guys want to listen, come in and listen. So All right, so on. check that out, especially you, uh, you American viewers, who uh, that will be that will be evening for you. All right, catch everyone next time. Anyway, take care. God bless.